Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome once again to the fourth annual Martin Luther King Day Symposium here at Seton Hall University in South Orange, New Jersey. I'm the Reverend Dr. Forrest Frechett. I am the senior advisor to the university provost for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm also the director of the Martin Luther King Leadership Program and a professor who teaches in the areas of Africana studies, uh, the university core religious studies, and interdisciplinary studies. I'm so proud to be your host this afternoon. While we have a number of my uh, colleagues and uh, allies who will be joining us <clears throat> to, um, to give us the broader context for understanding not only the struggle of Dr. King, but all of those who would fight for justice in the 21st century. Uh, we'll be looking at themes, looking at our religious heritage, uh, history, the humanities, race um, as a source and space for privilege, the institution of education, the areas of communication, uh, and uh, look at agencies and how relationships have been impacted not only by issues of social justice, um, but by the more recent pandemic. Uh, we'll be looking at concepts of peace and wellness, and then we'll have a number of faculty who will reflect <clears throat> on their recent work with the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we are hoping that indeed um, you will have a fruitful afternoon. <clears throat> we normally anticipate um, having an audience of well over 100 folks from the community, from Seton Hall faculty and uh, their families, and as well as we have well over 50 students who have signed up for the symposium as a credited course, who will be doing thorough analysis of everything that they see and hear today. So we hope that as Dr. King looks down from heaven, that he is mighty happy uh, with what we are doing here at Seton Hall University. I'm very pleased now to present our first presenter of the afternoon, uh, one of my uh, good, uh, I say brethren, in the faith and, and on the, in, in the place. Dr. Charles Carter in our Department of Religious Studies. Um, he is also, I believe, an ordained clergy. The Reverend Carter will be coming before us. And I've asked him to look at uh, the notions of racism in the Bible just as a means of reflection. While many people look at the Bible as, if you would, our basic instructions before we leave this earth, other people look at the Bible and attempt to rationalize their sense of privilege, uh, their sense of um, superiority, and their sense of power over other people. So in that context, um, Dr. Carter will be coming at us. I like to remind Dr. Carter and all other presenters that our timing will be as follows. Each presenter will have approximately 10 to 15 minutes for a presentation that will allow approximately five minutes for Q and A that we ask folks to put those questions in the chat so that our presenter can see it and respond accordingly. Without further ado, Dr. Carter, the space is yours. Please unmute yourself. I just did. Thank you, uh, Forrest. And um, here we are. Hopefully. Let me just do what I do at the beginning of every class. Can everybody see my um, slide that says racism in the Bible? Yep, we're all good here, sir. OK, cool. So, um, you know, Forrest, uh, it, it's a it's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon. It's uh, I, I have to say I'm so grateful to have tuned in a few minutes early and to have seen that edifying um, presentation because my uh, I always feel badly about my presentation because it's depressing. Um, because the heritage of the Bible is very tied to the institution of racism, the institution of slavery. We are going to see some foundational texts of white supremacy, but that's not all we're going to do today. There is going to be a prophetic call at the end. 
So before I really begin my remarks, I want to reflect on the legacy of Dr. King. There are many perspectives from which people call others to fight injustice and to promote justice. You can do it from an atheistic standpoint, an agnostic or a humanistic standpoint, as part of Catholic social teaching, from a Jewish or Islamic or, of course, Christian standpoint, from traditions of nonviolence that were affirmed by Mahatma Gandhi, or any of the great philosophical, religious, and intellectual traditions. But Dr. King um, was a minister of the gospel. It was the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth and the Hebrew prophets that informed Jesus that King spoke. His message was universalist, yet it was distinctly Christian, drawn from the rich experience of the African American church. We must remember also that he was political. He's not, off, he's not always remembered that way, though he is here every year. He challenged the social ills and the scourge of racism, but he also spoke eloquently and forcefully against some of the most powerful American institutions. And they're often racist, often genocidal, always capitalist and militaristic tendencies. These were the types of messages, this clarion call for justice for everyone, including our so-called enemies, that made him the target of the very institutions that he challenged. If he had taken the easy way and just um, been a preacher, he could have remained in the, sa the safe confines of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. He would not have been a threat to anybody. He wouldn't have been assassinated. But that's not the life he chose. Instead, he was a tireless critic of what we might call, and I think he would call, the fourfold American scourge of racism, materialism, militarism, and poverty. And so I want us to think before we talk about the Bible, um, I have these two quotes from Cornell West. Um, first, for King, the struggle against the legacy of white supremacy was never a strategic move or a tactical afterthought. Rather, it was a profound existential and moral matter of great urgency. King knew that white supremacy in various forms was a global phenomenon. It remains shot through our hearts and minds, institutions and structures, smartphones and unwise politicians. The modes of racist domination, from barbaric slavery to bestial Jim Crow Sr. to cruel Jim Crow Jr. Here he's talking about the carceral state and modern ways um, of imposing Jim Crow experience uh, on our African-American communities. These are never reducible to individual prejudice or personal bias. Empire, white supremacy, capitalism, patriarch and homophobia are linked in complex ways and our struggle against them require moral consistency and systemic analysis. This is from King's um, introduction uh, to his edited volume on the radical King. And um, from another point in that um, book, he speaks about not only Dr. King, but also Nelson Mandela. The two of them were two powering public figures in the past 50 years in the world, he said. Both have been Santa Clausified, tamed, domesticated, sanitized, and sterilized into non threatening and smiling old men with toys in their bags and forgiveness in their hearts. Yet both were radical and revolutionary. They were haunted, hated, and hurt by the powers that be, and both had radical love. I could end my presentation here, and we would have plenty to think about. Um, but what I'm, then I wouldn't be doing what Dr. Pritchett asked me to do. So the Bible, 
how are we going to frame the question? What is the Bible, right? This thing, this thing that I've taught for 30 years, more than 30 years. It's a book of beauty and it's a book of terror. For some, it's the word of God, every word inspired. For some, it's just another human book. Um, how is the Bible used is another question. In some ways, that depends on the way we answer the first question. Um, should we just accept it? Should we defend it when it offends our sensibilities? Should we reject it outright? Some would do so as misguided. We have to put away, I had to, this is a little bit about my own journey. I had to put away childish things. This is what the Apostle Paul says in his great chapter on love. When I was a child, I thought as a child. I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, but when I grew up, when I became an adult, I had to put away childish things. So sometimes we have to face uncomfortable truths. The Bible has a past and a present and a present. It doesn't just have a past of supporting racism. It has a present and a past of supporting patriarchy and sex sexism and homophobia and trans and other type of non-binary sexual phobias, all kinds of phobias. It has a past and a presence of supporting extreme nationalism, of justifying the persecution and the torture of others. The Bible can be used that way. For I think part of my life, I would try to domesticate the Bible, explain it away. Okay, yes, yeah, it was against slavery. How can you believe in the Bible? Well, they didn't mean it the same way that we meant it. Well, that doesn't matter. What matters is the way in which it is used. So it's not enough for me to talk about the beauty of Jesus's teachings or the power of the prophets or the grace of the Torah. If I do not admit that sometimes the Bible says, un says questionable things, sometimes the Holy Bible is unholy in what it calls for. And if I do not admit that personally, I can't speak for anybody else in the world. If I do not admit those things, then I cannot use scripture to promote justice unless I face its injustice. So these are what um, an early feminist scholar of the Hebrew Bible, she looked at a number of texts that are negative toward women and she called them texts of terror. And I think they're appropriate for our discussion of the Bible and racism. Now, I have four sets of texts, but I'm only going to talk about two of them because I probably am already close to the time that I need to end. I've got 1246. The first is the curse of Canaan. It is often in racist white texts that were used to support slavery. It's often called the curse of Ham. Ham was one of Noah's three sons. Uh, I'm going to not tell the entirety of the story, but Ham found his father in, an, in, a, in a compromising condition and he blabbed it out to his brothers. And when Noah awoke from his drunken stupor, he cursed not Ham, but his son Canaan. But ingenious, quote unquote, right? You know I'm using this in a... Um, sarcastic way. Students of the Bible said, oh, well, Ham in the biblical stories is the father of the Hamitic people, North Africa and the land of Canaan. And so therefore, when Noah says that Canaan will be the slaves of Shem, that means that it's okay for us to enslave African people because they're the descendants of Ham and they were cursed by Noah. No, they weren't. But that's one way that that text has been used. We can come back to that if there are questions. Lots of 
texts in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament uh, about slavery. How do you treat a slave? How can you own a slave? What are you supposed to do? What is the responsibility of owners to their slaves? Now, the Israelites weren't the first culture to have slavery. Some of those laws are taken directly from the Code of Hammurabi, an 1800 or so BCE text from Mesopotamia. So the Torah doesn't challenge slavery. So people said, well, because the Torah says slavery is okay, we can have slaves. Same thing with Paul. Paul writes about the institution of slavery, and he seems to accept it. And I could hide behind biblical scholarship and say, well, Paul didn't write those books in Colossians and Ephesians, where he quotes the household um, code. Paul didn't write them, so therefore Paul didn't mean it. Well, I don't know what Paul meant. And even if Paul didn't write them, they were used by people who said Paul wrote them. Paul gave permission for slavery. Now, I would like to think that the Apostle Paul that I teach in my intro to Bible class would be on the streets with his Black Lives Matter sign, that Paul would be appalled by slavery as it was um, practiced in this country, and that Paul would be appalled by our senators who are refusing to pass voting rights legislation. Okay? But I can't say that on the basis of direct quoting of Scripture. My job today is to say, these are some things, ways that scripture has been used support, to support racism. I really need two or three classes to do this. Another one would be the occupation of Canaan. And another one would be in Romans 13, where Paul tells everybody, look, governments are given to us by God, so obey the government. Problematic text. Now, why is this important? I want to move very quickly to um, yeah, here we are. James Cohn, often called the father of black uh, theology, wrote this tremendous book, but it's a it's an awful book. I hope that you will read it. If I were your teacher, I would assign it to you. The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And what Cohn points out there is that the symbol at the very heart of much of white Christianity is tied closely to the symbol of oppression and racism, the cross and the lynching tree. He gives a stark portrait of the role of the white church in practicing and celebrating lynching in this country. For white America, the cross is seen as a sign of salvation, even liberation, or reconciliation between God and humankind. But for the black church, Cohn says, Yes, it celebrates salvation, but it also celebrates lynching. It doesn't celebrate. It reminds them. It terrorizes people in the black church, according to Cone. It's the symbol of the lynching tree. Because the church aided and abetted. Here is, of course, um, I don't use these images lightly. I tell you that. Um, a picture of lynching and another postcard. We know that there were, we have church programs that invite you to come to our church picnic at which there will be a lynching. We cannot say that racism is not part of the fabric of this country or the founding of this country, and it's a religious experience. So I, I, I'd like to um, try to end. By the way, I, I do need to say this. When I was doing some work a couple of years ago looking at the way in which social justice and uh, issues of race and racism 
uh, are being taught today. I found this group of pastors in da the Dallas area who had written a long manifesto. And they said, well, we're against racism. Racism is sin. But we do not like the Black Lives Matter movement, right? We don't like um, social calls to social justice because calls to social justice are against the gospel. How that fits, I don't know, but these are, so don't think that the lynching, lynching tree is something in the past. Of course, we know that because we've seen George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and so many others. Another 200 black men were killed or black people were killed last year by police. So it's not over. So I'm going to just not talk about, but give you these texts because it's not all bad news. That part is wicked news. That part should make every one of us want to throw up and throw up our hands and ask God to help us if we believe in God. If I have dealt with these texts, then I have a right to use these other texts that are texts of liberation. Genesis 1, all humans are created in the image and likeness of God. The Exodus story, God is the God of the oppressed and God is never the God of the oppressor. And if I am not on the side of the oppressed, I am on the side of the oppressor. All kinds of prophetic texts, but I give you three books, Micah, Amos, and um, uh, Isaiah. All was op opposing the rich, standing for the dispossessed and calling us through the centuries to do the same thing. Jesus is hung on a cross as an enemy of the state, but he called for radical love, and he always challenged the social and economic status quo. And I'm going to end with this. These very little known books in the New Testament, or less studied, I suppose I should say, James and John remind us, if we do not love our fellow humans who we can see, how can we say that we love God who we cannot see? All right, thank you. I'm sorry if I went over. <laughs> no problem. I was monitoring the chat. I wanted to make sure that we did not miss any questions. And not unless I am mistaken, I don't really see any questions. I see a lot of, uh, you're getting a lot of applause digitally. <laughs> okay, I have the chat. I've got my thing in front and, of me. And so. um, uh, one other uh, testimony as comment came in from uh, a Natalie who said this is her second year for watching. And I believe it's it's proven to be a growth experience for her. I might add for everyone that when you mentioned Dr. Cohn, in religious studies in Africana, we uh, those two departments combined to sponsor a course called the Black Church, in which Cohn is mandatory reading. And similarly, you referenced The Radical King by Cornell West. Uh, that is one of the two books, which is, uh, which is mandatory for students who have registered for this symposium for credit. They will be doing an analysis of that. And the other book they read will be one written by King. So I thought I would share that with our audience. Chuck, Dr. Carter, we want to thank you so much for laying down a very strong foundation on uh, the Bible and um, and how it may be basic instructions before we leave the earth, but at the same token, uh, others will use it uh, in the service of oppressing other human beings. So just thank you so much. I appreciate that. Everybody thank can you, say sir. Yes, indeed. We now will be turning to another colleague, if all is set with our tech people. Um, we have Dr. Green, who is present. Um, Dr. Larry Green is a long-term faculty member and uh, alumni, uh, alumnus of C Seton Hall University. Um, he's in the history department and um, consistently does extremely good coursework for students in the areas of African-American history. And I believe this afternoon, um, Dr. Green is going to be, um, at least based upon our last conversation, He's going to be taking a look at the humanities, I think, perspective of history, if I'm not mistaken, through the eyes of James Baldwin. But we're going to let Dr. Green uh, come at us in his own way. Dr. Green, just want to remind you of our protocol will be you'll have uh, 10 to 15 minutes 
for the presentation mode, then hopefully uh, we'll have another few minutes at, after that for any Q&A, which we would encourage folks to put into the uh, chat. So uh, looks like you are ready to go. OK, uh, thank you, Reverend Pritchard. I'm going to share the screen. OK. OK, so let's see. Uh oh, well, there's something going on here. Dr. Green, I have your slides if you'd like me to share for you. Yes, that would be helpful. Yes, go right ahead. Here we go, MLK Day and Racism. Slide show. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk today about history and racism, and we're going to look at it through the prism of James Baldwin, a, an iconic African-American writer, novelist, essayist, playwright. He's been quoted in many places, most recently by Black Lives Matter. He's considered one of the great essayists and novelists of the 20th century. His uh, first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, was voted into the top 100 novels published in English globally in the second half of the 20th century. So, James Baldwin, born in Harlem, was a man with penetrating insight, insight into America and American history and America's racial history. So I'd like to begin talking about him. Um, first, I'd like to talk, though, about the reaction to the 1619 Project with uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. The initial reaction in the liberal and moderate press was quite praiseworthy. But then a conservative criticism came in, and then later on a notion of, of, of criticizing and, and debunking critical race theory. I would argue that Hannah-Nicole-Jones Nicole Hannah-Jones, great sin in the minds of the conservative critics was not theory, was not documentation, for she had that, she presented that. But her greatest sin to them was that she popularized the idea that the general public needed a greater understanding of African-American history and needed to read extensively in that history. Actually, the 1619 Project really reflects the last 50 to 70 years of scholarship in the field of African-American history, which really began to blossom in the 1950s and really accelerated through the 60s and 70s and 80s. But unfortunately, a lot of the many publications and books with the leading university presses and articles and the leading history journals were read primarily by historians and graduate students and maybe a few undergraduate history majors, some undergraduate history majors. But, that, but the great work done by those historians 
the great work done by those historians, had not filtered down into the public schools on a large scale. So many public schools were essentially teaching an outdated version of American history. And we'll talk about that in a moment. In addition, we find the civil rights movement, particularly after um, Charlottesville, accelerating their desire to eliminate these monuments to Confederate generals and officials, and also to the Confederate battle flag. Now, this is not new. We had that actually in the 60s. Then it died down, and then the movement to remove these. But then there occurred this negative reaction. Why were they interested in destroying history? The movement to re remove Confederate monuments and the Confederate battle flags from the southern state uh, uh, capitals was not an attempt to remove history, but rather to have the South and the nation confront its history. If they were willing to, to, to put text to these monuments, to talk about the Fort Pillow massacre of Union black soldiers, if they were willing to talk about slavery in these tours of antebellum mansions, of how it really existed on the plantations. So what we're really talking about here is an inability or refusal to confront America's racial past. And this is a great part of uh, the problem that we have had in the teaching of history. James Baldwin once said, ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Unfortunately, the power in America, the intellectual power, the intellectual leaders, boards of education, state boards of education, local boards of education, have sought to, in a way, escape from American history. And thusly escape from any sense of social justice and historical accuracy. Baldwin said on history, to accept one's past, one's history, is not the same thing as drowning in it. It is learning how to use it. An invented past can never be used. It cracks and crumbles under the pressure of life like clay in a season of drought. A prophetic statement from Baldwin. Let me just say this, that before I go on to the next slide, I met Herbert Abthecker at a conference of the Association for African American Life and History. Herbert Abthecker was one of the pioneer historians um, dealing, with, uh, dealing with slavery. And he wrote the classic American Negro Slave Revolts in 1944. And what is so interesting about this work, aside from the fact it stated such illuminating ideas, that slavery was a brutal institution to which African Americans resisted through day-to-day -day resistance of breaking farm utensils, to flight on the Underground Railroad to freedom, to actually planning revolts and leading revolts and conspiracies. In this classic work, Ab Thecker listed some 250 slave revolts and conspiracies. 
And Apthacker, who was being honored there, made an interesting statement. He said, a racist society needs a racist historiography. A historiography, the study of the past, what historians have said about the past. And that stuck with me. Because it, get, it gets at what Baum was talking about, an unwillingness to confront the past to romanticize the past, from gone with the wind to birth of a nation. So Baldwin was in many ways ahead of, 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 of his time, as was Abdecker. There's a very interesting new book that came out called The New Black Sociologist in 2018. And in it was a great essay by Professor Antonia Randolph of Winston-Salem State. And she made the case for Baldwin as a sociological theorist. The case can also be made for Baldwin's sophisticated use of American racial history in both his fictional novels and plays, but also in his classic, this is classes, <laughs> classic non-fictional collection of essays. And I would suggest anyone that is interested in American um, intellectual history, popular history, and race. Take a look at Notes of a Native Son, Nobody Knows My Name, The Fire Next Time, No Name in the Street, and The Devil Finds Work. Um, classic works. And what do I mean by an invented, romanticized, and mythologized past? We have these antebellum pastorals and reconstruction tragedies in American cinema, and a lot of people learn their, their history through film. So I'm thinking with Gone with the Wind and Birth of a Nation, which, which portrays slavery as this kind of idyllic institution that was non-oppressive and portrays reconstruction and the black quest for the vote and equality as mistaken, ruthless, led by ignorant black people seeking equality. If you've seen Birth of a Nation, you know this. For those who had uh, gone through the public school system and learned about slavery, they were often learning from the UB Phillips School of Slavery, who wrote American uh, Negro Slavery and Life and Labor in the Old South, 1918, 1928. But he began publishing even in the latter part of the 19th century. He set the stage for the portrayal of slavery as a benign institution quote, a school for civilizing. The horrors of slavery are downplayed. Slave revolt leaders, instead of see, being seen as freedom fighters, were portrayed in a chapter called Slave Crime in um, American Negro Slave. Reconstruction took its, its, its ideas from the works of Dunning, Burgess, and Bowers, William A. Dunning um, and, and Claude Bowers. And here, Reconstruction was portrayed as a tragic era. Why? Because Blacks got the right to vote and Blacks had mismanaged the, this, the, the Southern society as they had acquired the vote. But in fact, Blacks played a role black political leaders in the reconstruction of, of the South and rebuilding the railroads and ports and so forth and establishing a public school system. The books ignored the establishment of Jim Crow in the South, which essentially meant more than simply segregation. It meant the uh, basically racial pogroms against African-Americans. From the Hamburg Massacre in South Carolina, the Colfax Massacre in Louisiana, 
to 3,000 lynchings of blacks in the American South and even in other parts of the country, but primarily the South. The Ku Klux Klan and the paramilitary outfits that were formed were there, were all through this period. But where is it in detail? Maybe in the 1930s, you did not have the detail, but there were still studies being done. Now there is a proliferation of studies and has been over the last 50 years dealing with the violence that accompanied the establishment of Jim Crow, the political repression, the sanitizing of uh, the voter registration rolls by the removal of black voters. And what else do we see more recently? We see the rise of the civil rights movement and a premature statement of victory. The victory over racism, racism has been won. America has established a more equalitarian society. In some ways, the, the country used Dr. King to proclaim, after his death, to, to proclaim victory. When King, in fact, did not see victory. He saw some victories along the way, but the greater battle continued, where victory was truly not won. So why the persistence of racism, division, and failure to build a truly egalitarian multiracial society? It comes from an unwillingness to confront America's racial past, the intensity of that racism, the depth and breadth of that racism as it continues today. Baldwin quotes James Joyce when he said, James Joyce is right about history being a nightmare, but it may be that not that nightmare from which no one can awaken. People are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. But unfortunately, not the real history, but a pseudo history. As Baldwin said, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the world. But then you read, it was books that taught me that the things that tormented, tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. So Baldwin uses his experience growing up in the Depression in World War II, New York, as well as his knowledge of history to construct his worldview. In his first collection of now classic essays, Baldwin said of the past, I think the past is all that makes the present coherent and further that the past will remain horrible for exactly as long as we refuse to assess it honestly. Ten years later in Ebony Magazine in 1965, Baldwin added an addendum to that history. That is, that history does not merely, does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the greater force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us and if we carry an accurate view of history, no matter how disheartening it may be, no matter how oppressive it may be, we have the ingredients to know what we need to change and to know the difficulty that stands before us. If we're going to achieve a more democratic and egalitarian society. But you cannot run away from that history, you have to confront it. I would add neither historical amnesia nor the comfort of a romanticized pseudo history can liberate a people or America from its racial nightmare. Only the truth. 
the truth may set ye free. Amen. Historical truth may set ye free. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to open our floor up for any questions at this point in time. Any uh, in the chat? We'll keep our eyes on it. Thank you so much. You Thank built you. a cake like a multi layered cake around a Baldwin, and that's uh, I think for many people who are unfamiliar with his works and writings. I think you may have opened the doorway for a number of them to become uh, to spend more time with Baldwin. I still remember uh, decades ago as a, a freshman. Uh, in our English class, reading the fire the next time. Mm -hmm. And an awful lot for my generation. Are there any questions that I can see in the chat? OK, seeing none, we want to thank Dr. Green for sharing with us. Um, um, his most recent. Um, work that is looking at uh, a Baldwin in addition to uh, the classes that Dr. Green teaches. I might add um, uh, through, I think, special topics in Africana studies. Uh, Dr. Green has spent, I think, one of the last semesters doing a semester long course on Baldwin, so we are much appreciative of the quality of the effort you have put in. So thank you so much. Yeah, 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 thank you. And I put the quotes up there because Baldwin is such a wordsmith. He is one of the great uh, literary craftsmen. And Indeed. Um, Indeed. he is to be read. <laughs> so it was just my way of kind of putting uh, a little flesh on the bones rather than simply paraphrase uh, a brief look at the prose. Certainly. Ball. He was almost a forerunner, uh, at least for uh, one generation. Yeah. Well, and you can you see so the much. religious themes that go through his work, too. Oh, uh, absolutely. The fire next time, no name in the street from Job, uh, the devil finds work. I mean, uh, go tell it on the mountain from the black spiritual is the title of his novel. Um, Baldwin's take on Christianity and use of Christianity is very, very interesting. I think it dovetails very nicely with what uh, Professor Carter said. Thank you so much. OK, OK, um, I'm just going to entertain one question briefly uh, since uh, there was one I'm looking at Terence Fritzy Fritzky, who says, how do we combat the uh, detrimental role that American exceptionalism plays toward the perversion of our history? form what truly was or from maybe what truly was is that for me i'm going to guess yes. yeah well let me just say this baldwin does dress, uh, address this in a number of places in his writings he doesn't use the word american exceptionalism but i think he means the same thing and that is what he calls american innocence the desire on the part and quest for innocence means a desire to escape responsibility for the misdeeds and exploitation. And that somehow America has been uh, above the exploitation uh, of peoples and repression of peoples that we see globally in other countries and historically. And what Baldwin yes. said is no, that you are not. You do not escape responsibility Indeed. for that. You are not innocent. You know, I, um, many people may not be aware of the fact, but during his latter days on this earth, uh, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, better known to many as Malcolm X, was preparing to take the United States to the international, uh, I think, court system on that very issue, the violation of human rights. Uh, it's just that I've mentioned that for the students involved. You can make a note of that as we begin to move along. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, and uh, Thank you. you receive our applause each and every year. We now move on to our esteemed colleague, head of the political science department, uh, Dr. King Mott, uh, who always will bring a riveting and stimulating presentation. Uh, Dr. Mott is a member of the um, political science department, as I've mentioned 
And he is always on the cutting edge of thought. Mm. So we will now turn over our screens and our minds to the king. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'd just like to thank my colleagues. Uh, uh, I have just been taking notes furiously. And as you will see, I'm sharing a Word document because I've had to change my PowerPoint so many times based on the presentations <laughs> that it got a little uh, it got a little crazy, but I'll share that in a moment. Thank you in a particular way to Reverend Dr. Pritchett and to the work that you do here. Thank you also to the participants here. Um, I think it's extraordinary. And, uh, you know, full disclosure, white dude here from the South, um, if you'll notice, I have a bit of an accent from, from time to time. What's often lost about that accent, it, that is a lot of the sound of Africa. Uh, there are a lot of linguistics who trace much of the Southern dialects to the impact. Another, another example of how so much in American civilization and culture is, bi is built on enslavement, even our voices. Um, I'd like to turn quickly to a, a discussion of uh, white privilege. And you should see this screen now, a uh, Word document. I'll put it all in the chat later. And I also have a bibliography I'll be happy to share with you. Um, you know, white privilege is almost cliche now. Uh, and so I've tried to move away from the debate about its existence and maybe uh, talk about what white people can say that black people cannot, or how white people capture and control King uh, and his wife and the milieu of activists that Dr. Harris talked about earlier. I want to bring you into a poem by Auden that you can take a moment and take a look at uh, in a New Year letter. Uh, I, I've always used this in different ways, but I'm struck by Auden's humility where he argues that uh, in the true confession of our sins, in this alone, we are all the same. And I was thinking just recently about Dr. Green's no, notation of real history and the debate of that, that outside of that, there is no claim. So I trust Auden, and yet, as a social scientist, his voice and his argument for radical democracy is as a white person. And that is different than what civil rights activists did. And that's the, that's the distinction that we really have to take away today in a discussion from the literature, from juried social science evidence about what we call white privilege or what white people can say or how Martin Luther King is used. A, a brief bit of our, uh, Reverend Dr. Pritchett asked us to talk a little bit about our own narrative. I grew up in, on a cotton farm in Louisiana and I remember when King was shot and I was completely confused because the only king that I understood, now consider this, I am on a cotton farm in the Delta of Louisiana, right? In the, in, in the crossfire of the civil rights movement. And I was confused because I thought Martin Luther had something to do with Catholicism. So as a white boy, my world was so separate from the thousands of black people and the millions of black people that were engaged in this process. All the while, I was in a town with 400 white people and about 3,000 black people. So the notion of different realities in America is certainly not lost on me, nor is it on Tanahisi Coates, who writes here, as you can see, there's the story that sets this context of privilege. There it is. And as a social scientist, and those of you studying 
social science or interested in psychology or sociology, anthropology, politics uh, from this particular frame. All that is discussed by Coates here is, is, is richly grounded in evidence and, and implication. And so there is an amazing amount of information. And despite this information, despite this information, we have a very difficult time getting to the concept of addressing whiteness. I mean, think about it. When we talk about race in a conversation, if you're out tonight and you're going to talk about race because of the day that this republic is, is, is noting today, everyone at the table will assume that you're going to talk about black and brown people. Well, white is a race too. And it is that it is that fact that we seldom even associate it as a race that so much of the impact of race uh, drives white people's behavior. And again, we have evidence. We'll get to that in a moment. Race drives white people's behavior and white people in large part do not know it, do not acknowledge it, do not consider it. So here's a few more realities. You know about the brutal economic history of enslavement. You know about racial incarceration and for-profit prisons. Michelle Alexander's most recent, not most recent now, but one of her most important pieces, The New Jim Crow. Some statistics again in the context of this, of this discussion of whiteness. Um, blacks make up 13% of the US population, 40% of the US incarcerated population. You just gotta pause. White people and black people and brown people, we know this empirically, are no category of person has more, is more inclined to engage the law from the perspective. There is no difference. But when you look at the penalties, and particularly incarceration, it's overwhelmingly evident that something is driving the decisions of, and let's say it here, institutions and people who believe they're doing the right thing. And this is how Martin Luther King and other activists are whitewashed. Um, I, I, that's how they're whitewashed. You know, they're 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 co-opted into this kind of narrative of being uh, advocates for for certain kinds of behaviors. Again, we'll get into that in, in a moment. Um, there's more data collected by the U.S. government related to uh, prison populations. Notice New Jersey. Seven states maintain a black white disparity larger than nine to one. We also like to characterize the South for good cause. Racism is a national plague and terror. Health records, going through this quickly. This is out of research recently con con conducted uh, this study ended in, in, in 2004, but there was a follow-up in uh, 2018 that shows that race matters in the way that people experience healthcare. In actual prescription writing, there's a fascinating study done that looked at Latina physicians at Harvard and their prescription writing. And what was revealed is that this, these Latina women who have 
MDs. There is there is sophisticated scientifically as anyone can possibly be in in the developed world. Even that's a, a race to notion. And they were less inclined to write prescriptions for pain for black and brown people for the same circumstances and conditions. Let that sink in. Latina physicians did not trust the, the words, the stories of black and brown people as much as they trusted the words and stories of white people. So this phenomenon of racism, it is clearly something that is about voting, as we have talked about. It is clearly something about uh, access, but it cuts into layers of our everyday lives, into layers, as Bell Hooks wrote, layers of our public and private uh, discourses that that are astounding, that are astounding. So now we get to white privilege. And this is how I'll uh, talk about this and, and then bring some of the studies in from social science to kind of illuminate or illustrate the points as we go, as we go through this. The most significant response to this data, data, we're talking about here, we're not talking about opinion writing in the Wall Street Journal or in the New York Times. We're talking about quantitative research. So to put that into a context of accessibility, uh, for all of us in this conversation. It's the kind of research that must subject itself to subsequent review and testing in order for it to, to find its publication, to be expressed, right? So it has to be like in the great social, uh, scientific uh, method, it has to be able to be replicated. That's the data I'm talking about, not how Dr. Pritchett or Dr. Mott here feel about a particular topic, but how it is measured in the way that black and white people and brown people behave. There seems to be two categories in the social science literature that, that, that attempt to handle how this must or might be understood. These are all these are all theories. So you know, in the in the humility of 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 the academy, you know, come up with a better way of measuring, and we're all we're <laughs> we're ready to receive you. So the one way is a lot of this, a lot of racism and white considerations of itself and other can be understood in the in how we measure and and talk about ideology so just to be front just kind of like familiar with you all in this this is the this is the this is the category of people like the proud boys there they are you're not going to do anything really here <laughs> i mean i I'd like to think that an informed conversation would matter because as a teacher, it's why I teach. But what we see in the research is that once these notions become ideological, they are beyond negotiation and, in fact, are characterized and categorized as belief. So these two individuals here, standing proudly in front of a Confederate battle flag, 
see no inconsistencies in the way that those what they're saying what's on their shirts what they're what they're what they're advocating for they see no inconsistency between that and as dr carter pointed out organized religions that they belong to and the american constitution and even the civil rights acts to the extent that they are aware of them. So ideologically, when you get into this area of ideology, what the social science shows us is you're not going to get much. There's been some breakthrough on all of the prosecutions for the insurrection of last year. A lot of these proud boys, a lot of these proud, let's use the same gender, the proud girls they seem to be, um, they seem to have some awareness of white privilege when they're about to be sentenced. I haven't seen any research to, to measure how, and we probably don't even have the data yet sufficient to look at, did they mean it? Uh, I, we don't know that yet, but we are seeing some, some, some pretty interesting comments coming out. The second area in social science that does seem to have a great deal of space is this idea of internalized implicit racism when it comes to white people. We white people in outside of ideological constraints do have this do have a measurable uh, capacity to examine kind of in a micro way, not in a macro way, because that gets to be into this conversation of white people love to say I'm not racist. White people love to say I'm not racist. I have said that. And it took me years to come out of the closet in my own racism. You know, I came out as a gay man. I had to come out as a racist. I live in a raced society, so of course I have a raced screen. Just as the social science shows that, I, that, that everyone on this call is, is homophobic, including me. So where's the wiggle room? And so what the research shows is that white people can get into Black Lives Matter, can move into discussions of race when they begin to acknowledge the, their, their own story and how their story has been advanced, how their story has been aided by the circumstances of their race. So you want data, some data. And for those of you in this class, in terms of, of, of university work, um, um, you, you'll, you'll, I'll come back to that. Um, we'll get to this. The data is uh, one of the most interesting pieces of research out there looks at student debt. Yes, student debt is raced. There are more black and brown overwhelmingly. They carry 40% more debt collectively to go to university in America than white students. And if you look at how that works out in comparison to their incomes, there's something else working here because there are plenty of poor white people. In fact, just in terms of a frequency analysis, there are a hell of a lot more white people that are poor. But if you hold these constants in a, in a, in a regression analysis, there are systematic advantages for white people brought by institutions, brought by granting of scholarships, brought by access to resources, brought by even accesses to advanced technology and the capacity to use them. 
that enable poor white people to incur significantly less debt to attend university. That is white privilege. That is white privilege. It doesn't mean that the poor people, poor white people are bad people and that it's, un that it's unfortunate that they had that advantage. It means we have to examine that and bring the same opportunities and advantages and accesses to black and brown. So we get into some of the some of these ideas of privilege, and this is probably one of the more problematic ones. White progressives, and Martin Luther King talked about, about this, cause the most daily damage to people of color. Now, daily damage, remember, we're not talking about the Proud Boys. We're talking about the un- examined micro abrasions that bleed into absolute advantages economically, culturally, socially, and politically. I'll tell you, I'll give you an interesting study. There was a, there was a study that looked at who got hired on Wall Street, right? And they were trying, the researchers were trying to find out what did they do to kind of get pers for, past that first gate gateway? Because, you know, all these institutions, this is a recent study, this is 2017, all these institutions love to say that they have affirmative action hiring and that they are engaged in efforts of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I include that my own university in that. A lot of that's nonsense. Because these these simple notions aren't considered. Here was the notion. They said, well, maybe, maybe it's because of education. Maybe it's because of, uh, of speech. Maybe it's because what they found the most correlation was the way that a person, and these were men because it's harder for women to get here too, the way that men tied their neckties. My students who are on this line know this. I use this all the time in class. Blows my mind. So what that means is a certain kind of knot tied by a young man is going to send a signal, a message to the interviewer that he's got his stuff together. I started to get a little bit slippery with my language there. Sorry. That he's got it all together. Now, a person who has not had that kind of white experience will tie a necktie differently, perhaps. So, so the study says, so that the tie is higher, so the knot is larger. And if with the same credentials, with the same aptitudes and testing that these financial offices force all of their incoming potential hires to go through, the white, the white boys get the pass. These are white progressives. And look at that set. They can be the most difficult for people of color because we think we got it sorted. We got it sorted. We don't need to go into the weeds around our complicity, white complicity. Because however racism does impact people of color, at least where these white progressives are concerned, it's not really ugly, right? Which brings you back to that place about what white people can say that black people cannot. Robin D'Angelo, white fragility, if you're interested in more of this conversation. I wanna move very quickly through and, and connect some dots because I know 
uh, our moderator is is watching. This is 148, I see. Um, uh, how to end? Bell Hooks writes that we live in a world with serious class complexes. It is one thing to be a college student with loan debts and another to be just dirt poor for your entire life. The challenge is to come with more complex ways of understanding where we are, more global awareness of what connects Americans with what is happening with suffering and oppressed people all over the world. And I want to bring you into an example that many undergraduate students here actually know. So students enter higher education in America with different academic backgrounds. But what is irrefutable, this was a study done at the University of Michigan, is that more black and brown people come into higher education needing to take remedial coursework. They come from environments where access to education is not as valued. Often it's first generation and there isn't really an understanding of kind of of how to do college you know white kids know how to bullshit a professor a lot better from the get-go than black and brown kids it's just there it's just there right and so coming into higher education and having to take remedial courses remedial courses in in Oh, in all of the universities with very few, and you'd have to look at historical black institutions, I haven't seen that data, um, they don't count towards progress to degree. They don't count. So a kid's got to pay for it, work his ass off, work her ass off to get to a place, plenty of sense, Plenty of competence, just got to get me the tools. Doesn't count. So students coming in and taking remedial English, remedial mathematics, overwhelmingly raced. When you look at the at 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 at, at data that across the republic, um, and you're put a semester back. You add that to debt and you look at four and five year graduation rates and they are raced. So I want to conclude with white people have a lot of work to do. And I'm not talking about white ideologues. The research that we have shows is just not much that can be done. But I'm deeply concerned whenever we start saying how well we're doing. And that bothers me about the arguments at Seton Hall University around diversity, equity, and conclusion. Because if you ask students on the ground how well we're doing, it's certainly not as rosy as our marketing material. And, and, and that is all of our fault, but it is the responsibility of people who have these privileges to initiate these conversations, to, to follow up these conversations with proposals in our governance. You know, I don't have to heal the planet but we each operate within an environment where this, the things can be done. My colleagues know that, that, that things can be done in our classrooms. They don't give anyone an unfair advantage, but provide for different kinds of people from different kinds of experiences. Still going to have to hustle, still going to have to work. As Michelle Obama said about her Ivy League education, 
I got the opportunity. I had to complete it. I had to finish it. And to finish it in that white place, she believed, was much harder than to finish it for white people with the same kinds of backgrounds and experiences. I had to trust that. She lived it. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, thank you for the, uh, the, 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 the chance to discuss this briefly and also to, to bring into focus on, on this really important day that racial conversations are white conversations and, and, and must be had, um, must be had. We are not here to talk about what, what black and brown people need to do. We're here perhaps to discuss what we all need to do uh, and, and, and why people figure largely in this work, in, in this project. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Pritchett, for this opportunity. And thank you to my colleagues for their presentations earlier. Thank you, Brother King. I wonder if one of the implications is, do we need to provide or do we not? <laughs> spaces for white people to gather and congregate and to facilitate even on our campus is that uh, one of the questions that yeah uh, i would i would even be curious about the racial breakdown of the people attending this today you know i it would be interesting to it would be interesting to see um but yeah i don't know you know why people don't do that uh mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things that that people like my colleagues that happen to be white on this presentation, we can we can kind of have to bring that, which was kind of part of the conversation, right, Forrest? You know, yes. what white people can say that black people can't, not because black people don't have the capacity to say it, but they're not in the same spaces. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're we're gonna move on now to our next colleague. Um I presume he was here as I look. Dr. Edward Adjapon, there he is, indeed, right on target, from our College of Education and Human Services. He will be bringing his very unique skills of analysis um, to the field of education, all the way from how we see uh, children in the classrooms to perhaps the preparation for teachers. And Ed, Ed I'd like just to remind you. As best we can, we ask each presenter to take approximately 10 to 15 minutes of presentation that allows about five minutes for uh, Q&A. So, Ed, if you are ready, I hope they can put you on the screen. I hope everyone is not only enjoying what you're hearing, but appreciating the thoroughness at which our presenters are uh, preparing the material uh, that they present to you. And I believe the level that they are elevating our thought to what I call critical reasoning skills. And I am highly appreciative of all of this. Hello. Good afternoon, Dr. Pritchard. How are we doing today? We're doing good. Maybe you might want to turn your volume up a little bit. You, that's just how I heard it. There we go. Is this better? Yes, it is. All right. And our, our tech people need to make you visible, I think, at least from my screen. Okay. Here you come. Here we are, are we good? I'm gonna to yield to our tech people, because my <clears throat> screen is blank. We're having some difficulty with your, your camera. We can we can hear you though. So are, are, is that about me, my camera? Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm looking visible. Okay, do you see my slides? No. Do not see your slides currently, no. Hmm. Okay. I mean, for the sake of time, Dr. Perch, do, do you want me to just continue? What are your right. thoughts? If you can give us a narrative, perhaps. Absolutely. 
Okay, sorry, sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. Um, you know, in the in the era of you know, Teams University and Zoom University, I apologize for the def for the difficulties. Um, my name is Dr. Evan Ajapong, and I'm going to talk to us about education and racism. And you know, this morning when I was thinking about like which way I want to address this idea, um, I wanted to just think about you know what I talked about last year. I presented last year. Dr. Pritchett invited me, and last year I talked about how we were just such a divided nation, um, and that theme continues to exist today. Right, and last year we talked about being a divided nation. I was th just thinking about the context of, you know, January 6th and the insurrection um, that our capital and our, our country and our democracy has faced, right? And just looking at those images of folks, um, you know, raiding the Capitol building um, because of these ideologies that Dr. Mott kind of described so eloquently in his presentation just, just prior to mine. Um, and just thinking about what does that mean and where does that leave us as a country and as a nation that's grappling with this continuously, especially today on Dr. Martin Luther King's um, birthday, right? I think today is a day that we just want to sit back and as, as a nation, right, reflect on just the life and legacy of Dr. King, but then also for us to recognize how can we continue this legacy, right? And for me, when I think about education and, and I think about the challenges of racism that exists within our educational systems and structures, you know, today I was thinking about this attack, right, on critical race theory um, that that persists, right? Um, and, and it's become more popularized over the last year since the spring, um, mainly in politics, right? But when we think about critical race theory um, and just this idea, right, before I even go into articulating what critical race theory is, you know, it's it's an idea of an, or a phenomenon, philosophy that's been banned already in nine states, right, and across different education um, within educational structures, right. These states including Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Arizona, and North Dakota, right. In addition to critical race theory being banned within educational systems within these nine states, there are also twenty additional states within our country that have introduced or plan right to to do something similar around a ban around critical race theory and when we think about the polarization of our of our nation um, and of the politics of our nation um it's important for us to understand like what what critical race theory actually is and what it promotes right so what critical race theory promotes is kind of this kind of it promotes conversations and discussions around systemic um systemic oppression right and recognizing it recognizes that race is a social construct and race exists right within systems and institutions and it's not merely like an individual experience right or a construct that's based off of individual bias or prejudice right so that they, they can be an idea that an individual can be racist and have racist ideologies but at the same time that that idea can permeate into um, educational systems and structures, national systems and structures, um, et cetera, right? I think Dr. Mott talked a lot about like, you know, what, how that manifests itself within institutions, right? He talked about the justice system, right? And how we see a large disparities of, of black and black and black um, men and women compared to white, their white counterparts, right? We see within the educational system, we talk about the edu educational outcomes and disparities there. We see it in housing access, right? So access to proper and adequate housing, right? But also that this idea and concept of redlining, right? That has limited black and brown communities from buying property within particular neighborhoods, right? Or, you know, getting hit with, you know, a higher interest rates than their white counterparts, right? So this idea that racism can exist within systems and structures is absolutely legitimate, right? And it's one for us to, to really think about. Um, but the idea and the philosophy of critical race theory is one that gets us, to, it, it allows us to interrogate how race manifests within systems, right? But this philosophy of critical race theory is something that has emerged in the 1970s and 1980s um, around legal scholars, Dr. Bell and Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. And as an educator and as a scholar who does work across the country, I can tell you firsthand that most schools are not engaging in a critical race theory, right, within their classrooms, right? But oftentimes when we hear the when we hear critical race theory, right, I think we hear things that are synonymous with critical race theory, social justice, anti-racism, privilege and oppression, right? And all of these words kind of conflate into the same idea and ideology um, that 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 recognizes that there is an oppressor and that there is an oppressed. 
And this is what critics of critical race theory, right, are trying to stop. Right. They're trying to stop this idea and this notion that there's an oppressor, oppressor and that there's an oppressed community, a, a group. And it's really hard for us to step away from that notion because that's the reality of, of, of our of our nation. That's the reality of the history of our nation. Right. Since the birth of our, of our country and also recognizing how America has gotten gotten its footing um, as a super um a superpower within our world and our global atmosphere and thinking about the impacts of slavery, right? And Jim Crow segregation, you know, et cetera. And thinking about how all of these institutions have privileged white folk, right? And it's important for us as education, you know, as educators, as teachers, as folks who work within institutions and universities to create opportunities for young people to make sense of this, right? Like I'm not one for saying yes, we have to, you know, we have to provide and 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 implement this specific way of thinking on a particular group. But as an educator, it's our responsibility to provide our students, our young people, the people in our communities, our families, with all of the evidence, right? And then the idea is that we hope that we we can that folks have the critical ability to dis, to decipher and make sense of the evidence and the, and the knowledge that's there, right? But what this ban on critical race theory does within schools is that it turns into not only can we stop, not only must we stop considering um, this idea of race as racism as institutional and structural, right? It bleeds into we don't want to learn about the narratives and experiences of, of black and brown people. We don't want to bring those experiences into our schools, right? We don't want to learn about these realities. And that becomes, that creates a very dangerous dangerous narrative, right? But it also contributes to the erasure, the erasure of, you know, of the, the black and brown experience, right? When we when we learn about racism or we learn about, you know, historically marginalized groups within schools, right? It's often presented through a deficit lens, right? We learn about slavery, right? We learn about the civil rights era and the civil rights movement and to Jim and Jim Crow within with, within school and or in school, but these narratives and these historical um, experiences are often presented through a deficit lens, right? While in the midst of this, if we continue to erase critical race theory and this idea, right, that racism is in, um, institutional and systemic, we also erase the positive stories, right? We're erasing the resilience that these communities and these groups of people have pushed through to continue to survive, right? You know, black and brown people, historically marginalized people are, you know, they're pushing through society as we speak today, right? Um, even with all the systemic oppression that that has been that that they face over the last hundreds of years within our within our country, and it's really important for us to to acknowledge this within schools, right? Because the first thing is an acknowledgement of the history, right? We cannot erase this history. Once we erase this history, um, you know, all students grow up considering that you know, or thinking that, you know, or not understanding the experiences of the historically oppressed and historically marginalized black and brown communities um, specifically, right? And we have to get into a space where we can acknowledge these experiences, learn from them, but also grow from them, right? And as a, as a scholar, you know, my work, you know, really lies at the intersections of, of supporting students of color, um, engage, finding engaging ways to, you know, to engage in content, specifically science content. But, you know, I also leverage my love, my passion for hip hop as a way of doing this, right? So I wanted to share briefly just a positive moment within Black history, right? Because even when we learn about Black history and even amidst this erasure, this erasure of Black history um, within our school systems across the country, right, it's important for us to provide these positive narratives, right? So I argue and, you know, I make the argument that, black, that the, the creation and the development of hip hop within New York City and the Bronx, specifically in the 70s, is a recognition of black resilience and black innovation, right? There were students, young people from immigrant populations and backgrounds and communities who lived in the Bronx who just wanted to, you know, find ways to engage in their community, right? They love music, right? Um, they wanted to find ways to gather peacefully. And this was in the midst of a social economic depression in New York City, right? So we think about, we put our critical lens on, we could recognize that, you know, these groups and these communities um, didn't have the resources, right? They were, they were economically um, disadvantaged in these spaces. 
Um, and these are all these are all contributions from historical, institutional, and systemic um, policies um, that impact community members on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So hip hop was created out of this. Hip hop was birthed. And hip hop, you know, nobody gave anybody a tool book or a toolkit as to like, this is how you make music, right? Or this is this is how you should sound. But it was more like tinkering and innovating and finding resilience to continue to push through whatever oppression that they faced within that moment to create something that that made them feel grounded, that made them feel happy, that made them feel this communal, this this community amongst each other. And that's the beauty and the resilience of hip hop, right? Developed in the 1970s um, during a time where there was increased violence. Um, the Bronx is literally burning, right? And um, landlords will will light their um, their apartment buildings on fire to recoup the insurance money and to move out of the community, right? In the midst of this young people, they found joy, right? They, there was, they, you know, ultimately there was nowhere to, no, nowhere to go, nothing else to do, but in the moment, in the midst of that, to find joy. And that's where the resilience and the brilliance comes through and shines through, right? So I always make the argument that hip hop is a constructive and contested space for historically oppressed, and marginalized to resist um, and challenge social ideologies. But hip hop also provides an opportunity for these young young people in these communities to share their voice. It provides this platform that everybody wants to engage in. And we think about how hip hop started in the 1970s and where it is today, right? Um, the, the founders of hip hop would never have never imagined it to be to go this far, right? To be a, a multi-billion dollar industry um, that supports um, or that, that that was birthed from the South Bronx, right? And that's the beauty and the resilience of hip hop. So I kind of, I'm closing to, close to closing, and I want to just talk about, um, I want to bring in a Martin Luther King quote that reads, to save a man from the morass of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to shift and weigh evidence, to dis discern the truth from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction, right? And what Dr. King is is, is saying in this quote or, or, or referencing in this quote is that it's important for us to provide young people, to provide our youth or anybody with evidence so that they can discern on their own, right? So instead of banding or, or continuing to have challenging and ban critical race theory within our schools across our country, it's important for us to think about how we can create opportunities to interrogate systems of oppression, right? And these systems and institutions that contribute to the collective oppression of specific groups. It's necessary for us to build relationships with historically marginalized communities, to offer support without centering ourselves and our institutions, to generally and authentically offer support. And while we can offer what support we have with our resources, we can be proximal in order to gain authentic understandings of these communities and really identify what support and how can we really push the envelope? How can we address policies and change things to be more inclusive of all people, right? You know, instead of interrogating race through a deficit lens, share stories of triumph, innovation, persistence of historically marginalized groups and creating opportunities for authentic dialogue regarding how systemic institutional structures have contributed to the oppression of certain groups. We, we must acknowledge, you know, you know, finally, we must acknowledge, you know, that racial justice is systemic fair treatment of people of all races, resulting in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all. Right. It's it's not just that the absence of discrimination or, or inequities. Right. But we really have to be critical of how we're dismantling, interrogating um, systems and structures and policies that contribute to in inequities. Um, of specific groups, right? We have to take a critical look of our look at ourselves and how we're engaging in the world, but we also must, you know, challenge our friends, you know, challenge us our our immediate spaces of work, our classrooms, our labs, um, our social groups, our families, right? Continue to do research, learn about the experiences of, of the historically marginalized groups, read books, articles, um, and really try to recognize that we have to address systems and policies if we ever want to move towards a more equitable and just system and community. That's rather, that's excellent. Thank you for so much, Dr. Adjiapan. We're going to uh, open the floor up, so to speak, through our chat system. If there is a uh, question, Dr. Edmund, we're gonna ask you to also, uh, if you would um, just take, 
and take a look at the chat so we can quickly identify any questions that may pop up. Absolutely. Are we able to see slides? That's good. To, that's good to know. Um, yeah, great points. Um, Linda Carton, do our students feel that we are looking at history through a positive lens now? I guess it depends on the context. I guess it depends on how we are interrogating it. And I think the reality, Linda, is that it's much more difficult to look and find positive narratives because they don't they not they don't exist within our faith. They don't exist right there, right? We always the deficit narratives are 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 what are most popular. So it might take time to like really dig and decipher and find those positive narratives, but they always exist. It just takes us as educators and scholars to kind of do that extra work to, to find them, identify them. Thank you for your time um, and thanks for the invitation, Dr. Reverend Pritchett. Thank you, my brother. It's always a pleasure to be in your midst. I know that the future of education and, and the public school system <laughs> and parochial is in good hands and good minds with your involvement. Absolutely. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you. What a real pleasure. It's like going to a buffet with uh, all the uh, delicacies that we all would like to uh, partake in. And it's such a pleasure to have our colleagues uh, putting their, their all in all into the process. We are now going to move into. Um, the area of looking at uh, race issues and communications from the perspective, I asked my colleagues whatever way they would like to take a look at this. Dr. John Rodwan from the uh, School of Communications and uh, Dr. Todd Stockdale from the University Corps will come uh, before us in this own way and manner so that they will explain to us um, what they believe is most essential for us to take away uh, from their joint analysis in honor of Dr. King today. So my brothers, I turn the uh, floor over to you. Thank you so much, Reverend Pritchett. Uh, it's an honor to be here this afternoon honoring Dr. K. Uh, my name is John Radwin, and I'm joined here today by my partner and colleague. Dr. Todd Stockdale. <laughs> Our title today is The Company We Keep, MLK in Shoes Core, and we want to start off with a brief exercise. So please get yourself a Word document or a pen and a paper. And the question to you all is, what have you been watching over the last 48 hours? In one minute, two days, what media experiences have you engaged? Have you watched a film or some TV? Have you read any books? How about social media? Have you interacted with groups or friends or influencers? Or maybe you watched the news or played some games or listened to music or enjoyed some art? And I've been talking, so you've only got 30 seconds left. So go. Now that you got a few of your media experiences down, your next challenge is to please take a look and think about who the primary people were. What was the main character in the television show or film or in the news story? Who was the main person? Be honest. List all of your media experiences. And great, that's one minute. What we're doing here is a media log exercise growing out of the book uh, from Dr. Wayne Booth called The Company We Keep. Booth's idea, which is a fantastic one, is to instead of think of media experiences as something that is separate from you, like in a book or on the television, think of the people and characters as people that you spend time with. So media isn't just out there in the ecosphere, media sphere, and it's not just out there in the media village, it's right there in your neighborhood or even in your house. So perhaps if you listed Harry Potter as a film that you watched, Harry is someone who lives in your house, in your heart, and in, in your head. 
So what you start to do there is start to think through the ethics of the people that you've invited into your home, into your head, into your heart, and try to discern who you should be engaging and maybe who should be moving away from a bit. <laughs> so that brings us back to our title. We're focusing on MLK today. MLK has uh, clearly been invited into everybody's house today. We're all participating in this course together. And so again, our title is The Company We Keep. I'm Dr. Radwin, and I'm happy to be joined with Dr. Stockdale. He's going to take the first main point and tell you about how MLK is involved in Seton Hall University's core curriculum. Thank you, Dr. Radwin. Um, hello to all who are gathered here this afternoon. Uh, as Dr. Radwin mentioned, I'll be speaking briefly here about Dr. King's inclusion in our core curriculum. Um, I come at this as someone who's taught in our core for the past 11 years. I've served also as the uh, coordinator for Journey of Transformation from 2016 to 2021. Um, if we're going to if we're going to speak meaningfully about Dr. King and Seton Hall's core curriculum, we really have to first engage with questions like what exactly is a core curriculum? Why have a core curriculum uh, and whose voices to include in a core curriculum? And that then by extension raises questions about whose voices uh, get excluded. Um, to be clear, each of these questions um, invites no small amount of discussion and debate. Uh, we could, in fact, have uh, full day-long symposiums around each of those questions and still not come close to exhausting uh, the complex issues surrounding core curricula, uh, not least of which is the debates around who actually gets a say and what is and what is not included uh, in a common set of readings. Obviously, time doesn't permit us to explore uh, these rather important debates in detail, but uh, hopefully if I've gestured towards them here, uh, that will invite further reflection uh, of their importance. Um, still, I do want to briefly tackle that main question of what is a core um, and then why have a core and whose voices do we include in the core? And I want to do so in an effort to situate Dr. King within our core curriculum here at Seton Hall. So to that end, rather than engaging really in these questions in an abstract way or some theoretical realm, I actually want to ground them here uh, in our shared experiences at Seton Hall. And I want to explore what the core curriculum is at this university, uh, why we have it uh, and how we've navigated inclusion or at least have begun to do so. I want to take these uh, questions actually slightly out of order. I want to start with uh, why we have a core here at Seton Hall. Um, you see there's actually a time when we in fact did not have a core curriculum or I guess at least not the core we have now. Um, to you students uh, who are joining us today, you probably don't know a Seton Hall experience that doesn't include journey of transformation or Christianity culture and dialogue or, uh, or, or our signature three courses. In fact, many of our faculty, if they're like me, don't know a Seton Hall without these courses as well. Uh, when I arrived at Seton Hall, uh, our core curriculum was already established. Yet, I mean, in those days before the signature courses at Seton Hall were developed, uh, there was this sense amongst faculty, from what I understand, that something was missing from our community. Um, there was a desire to engage with some of the big questions, those questions that anim animate our human experiences, questions like, uh, what is the path to true happiness and fulfillment? Um, is there purpose and meaning to life? Um, what does it mean to be human? What, what about suffering? What about those things uh, that we might call evil? Uh, realizing that these questions are actually not unique to us and that there's this rich trove of intellectual sources out there uh, that have responded to these questions through the centuries. And in fact, these sources have given shape to the world we currently inhabit. Uh, our faculty set out to develop a common set of texts, uh, texts that everyone would read together in order to facilitate this conversation uh, on campus amongst our students, amongst our faculty, uh, and amongst, amongst our administrators. And really, that's in fact what our core curriculum is. It's grounded in the Catholic intellectual tradition. Uh, we've developed a set of common texts that all students are going to be reading together. Uh, these texts take up the questions that are central but not exclusive to this tradition. Uh, they do so in an effort to generate ongoing conversation amongst our community about some of the most profound issues uh, of our human experience. Well, one way to think of the core here at Seton Hall is, is really to imagine the voices we encounter in our readings as a common set of virtual friends. Uh, these are people that uh, we've invited into our home. These are people and ideas that we want to spend time with in order to better understand ourselves and our world. They are the company we keep, as Dr. Rodwin was mentioning. Uh, there's this recognition that we're not the first to consider these questions uh, that, and that by engaging some of the most foundational uh, and influential thinkers of various traditions, uh, we can stand on their shoulders, as it were. Uh, to see the questions from and perhaps address the challenges of our own culture uh, more clearly and effectively. I mean, of course, as, as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest questions about a core curriculum uh, or a common set of conversation partners 
that is the company we keep, um, is whose voices to include in the set of shared texts. Actually, to put it even actually a little bit more directly, one of the criticisms of core curricula in the Western tradition is they often exclude voices. They exclude voices of members from marginalized communities, specifically voices of women uh, and people of color. I suspect those of us here today actually would likely see this as a valid criticism. And indeed, a good bit of the ongoing conversation around Seton Hall's core curriculum focuses on these concerns, and we have much more work to do in that area. But thankfully, a core curriculum, or again, a common set of virtual friends, conversation partners, the company we keep, it is something that can evolve, and it's something that can be adapted. Uh, and to begin to address these concerns and engender a more robust and fruitful conversation, bringing in voices from those who are marginalized, excluded traditionally. Several years ago, the faculty here at Seton Hall actually we recognized a glaring absence of a significant conversation partner in our core curriculum. Um, a person we needed, uh, we needed as a virtual friend to help us better see ourselves, better understand our world, better understand this world we live in, to see the injustices of racism, the oppression and marginalization of the poor, um, to respond to these uh, systematic injustices through nonviolent resistance. But not only was our actually shared conversation in need of Dr. King's insights and influence, we also benefited from his example of one who himself had spent time with the great text from our tradition. And we saw him draw upon these virtual friends to forge change uh, during actually a really dark time in our nation's history. Uh, in Dr. King's mountaintop speech, which is now part of Seton Hall's core curriculum, he draws extensively on the ideas and narratives of Plato and Socrates, the Exodus, the parables of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, all of which we've encountered in our core already. However, what we actually now know about this speech, it was delivered on the eve of his assassination. And Dr. King was actually not prepared to speak that night. Uh, he had been ill. He had not been feeling well. Uh, there were storms there in the Memphis area that night. It was assumed that maybe only a small group would gather uh, for, the, for the evening. But that, in fact, didn't happen. And after learning that a large crowd had assembled, Dr. King left his hotel room, uh, made his way down to the Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee. And without preparation, no notes, he spoke extemporaneously and effortlessly about these texts and the virtual friends that he had spent so much of his time with through the years, the company he'd kept. Um, this is a man who was steeped in the great text of our tradition. He drew upon the ideas of these texts in order to call our culture to better care uh, for all of God's children. And Dr. Rodwin is now going to address education as formation, how the company we keep is important, and he's going to share a little bit more in depth about who Dr. King kept company with. Thank you so much, Dr. Stockdale. Uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner, I've got a picture of Willie James Jennings. He's an author that I've been learning a lot about lately. In 2020, he wrote a book called After Whiteness and Education in Belonging. Jennings's word for education is formation. And when I first heard it, it sounded a little bit strong to me. Uh, and Jennings doubles down on it and even triples down on it. So formation, formation, formation. That's the shining goal of all education. The basic idea is that we do form and change one another as we communicate, especially in educational settings. And in the past, education may have been about mastery or having arrived, the 21st century education that Jennings is proposing is an education for belonging, community, inclusion, and mutuality. So the contrast is stark. If you look at modern education in the Western world, Jennings would call that distorted formation, where we're convinced that we can be done, that we can be independent of one another, and that we can exhibit mastery. And again, his alternative is to say, we're not done. We have more to learn and we're not independent. We need one another and depend on one another and nurturing those relationships is the way forward to a society of justice and peace. So if we apply this to the company we keep idea, the people we study become a part of us. Some of those people can help us advance in belonging. And so uh, we just heard from Dr. Stockdale about Seton Hall University and our relationship with MLK and the Corps. And of course, today we're celebrating MLK Day. And then the bigger picture, you can think of our country. We only have 10 federal holidays, four of those honor people, and one of them is MLK. 
And so learning from our heroes is a great way to move forward toward belonging. So like we did with the media log, try to think of those people that you engage virtually in books and television programs and films and so on as formative influences and then think backwards through the chain. So who formed those people? And so for today's question, it's who formed MLK? And there were a lot of formative influences. Of course, his father was key, but the one I'm picking today is Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was known as MLK's spiritual advisor. And then you keep going back in the chain, one of the people Howard Thurman learned from is Mahatma Gandhi. In 1935, Howard Thurman led a pilgrimage of friendship to India to learn from Gandhi about nonviolent resistance. And the lessons that he brought back are lessons that we can still learn from today. So overall, uh, we're trying to elevate our education and become more enlightened. And the way we do that is being formed by one another and standing on the strong shoulders of our past greats so that we can reach toward peak experiences. So here are just a few quotes that I pulled from Howard Thurman on the intersection between religion and communication a field that I'm honored to study. To start off, I picked Thurman's high school graduation picture to try to illustrate the idea that none of us are finished and we all have more to learn. So he was his the valedictorian in 1919, but he didn't know a lot of the things then that he learned as he moved on his career. So in 1949, Thurman published Jesus and the Disinherited. This is the book that Dr. King was known as uh, carrying around in his briefcase throughout the civil rights movement. Here are two quick quotes from it. The first one I think gets at Dr. King's, uh, Dr. Mott's uh, question over in the chat. It cannot be denied that too often the weight of the Christian movement has been on the side of the strong and the powerful and against the weak and the oppressed. This despite the gospel. So the first step is a little bit of humility and self-criticism in recognizing really that every tradition has got weaknesses. And then sadly, especially the Christian tradition has been twisted against itself to serve as an instrument of oppression. The second quote I pulled in my reading comes directly from that 1935 visit to Gandhi. If a man knows precisely what he can do to you or what epithet he can hurl against you in order to make you lose your temper, your equilibrium, then he can always keep you under subjection. The idea here is that uh, enemies will frequently try to trigger us and especially push us toward violence. And then as we do, nothing gets better. Violence solves nothing. So maintaining equanimity and e equilibrium, a lesson from the Hindu tradition, is a shoulder that I see Thurman standing on here, and I'm honored to stand on that shoulder as well. My next quote comes from a 1951 book called Deep is the Hunger. As a communications scholar, one of the key things we study is freedom of speech, and I would encourage everyone to please use that freedom just like Dr. Thurman does. So the first part of the quote, do not be silent. If you're faced with injustice, which we all are in this country, <laughs> speak up. And then, well, why? Because we're incredibly powerful. There's no limit to the power that may be released through you. And so again, with this quote, recognize that it's not like his power. Instead, he's relaying power. The last quote comes from the luminous darkness. And whoa, and this is a philosophy that I, there we go. <laughs> this is a philosophy that I personally love. It's the hardcore of spirituality. A strange necessity has been laid upon me to dedicate my life to the central concern that transcends the walls that divide and would achieve in literal fact what is experienced as literal truth. Human life is one, and all men are members of one another. And this insight is spiritual and is the hardcore of religious experience. So to be a hardcore religious person, we recognize that we're all in this together. 
And if we're going to get toward a culture of peace, it needs to be something that's done cooperatively with concern for one another. This brings us to our closing exercise. If the canon is a set of readings that we all do together and we recognize that it's limited, our challenge is it to elevate it, to bring it up. So for our closing exercise, lift up the canon. Yes, it's heavy, just like that canon copier, but when we lift together, we can all get better and closer toward the peak, toward the mountaintop. And so again, the question is, whose shoulders are you standing on? Well, we did that in the media log. Now let's recommend some authors to one another. If you had the opportunity, and you do, to elevate the canon, who would you recommend we read and why? So right now, over in the chat feed, please post at least one worthy source that the rest of us should check out. For Dr. Stockdale, I asked him to post over in the chat uh, the Howard Thurman Listening Room from Boston University. It's just fascinating. In the 20th century, Thurman was ahead of his times and knew that media was the way to reach people. So when he retired, he collected all of his sermons and put recordings in libraries across the country and in 17 other countries for Howard Thurman Listening Rooms so that we can learn from him and stand on his shoulders. And so we might not have time right now to look at each other's sources, but the chats here, we can log back into the meeting. Please commit to looking over uh, each other's sources. And so that brings us to our last minute or so uh, for some question and answer. Thank you for listening to Dr. Stockdale and myself talk about the company we keep, MLK and Seton Hall's core. Thank you, my brothers, for uh, really uh, taking us to the mountaintop in your preparation and your execution. Uh, Howard Thurman is one of our heroes uh, for a number of us because we know that in order for any one of us to exist and to activate ourselves, that someone else was in that space before us. So they were the precursors. And indeed, uh, you, you correctly uh, identified Thurman as the precursor uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, Dr. King. And... Um, and thank you, Todd. I just noticed which, um, some of the pieces that were placed in the uh, chat. Are there any questions for these uh, two scholars? I'm seeing some great sources show up. I'm putting another yeah. one in there right now. I see a hand raised. <clears throat> we would prefer that you place your um, a question in the chat, please. Here, that's Chuck, I think. Yeah, he's uh, Dr. Carter has listed uh, Jesus and a disinherited. Right, that's the book that Dr. King was known to carry with him in his briefcase. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kind of like follows the model of each one teach one. That is, as we leave our legacy behind, uh, someone either picks it up or it's planted within their own, be it spiritual or literary DNA, which I also appreciated uh, you guys giving us the uh, the signals that we all have to really lift our own weight <laughs> and for some of us i don't know this the globe that we carry in this world is getting heavier and heavier i just saw a great suggestion from zachary edwards man's search for meaning is an optional text for core 1101 oh. and it deals with holocaust narrative and it's an incredibly powerful book that i'd echo zachary in recommending certainly i think kelly shea also put i'm trying to move my cursor a little bit that's not really happening too well today but kelly had a, a very profound point whomever gets to it he's looking at the intersectionality of um environmentalism and green girl leo on instagram
Thank you, guys. All Thank right. you so much. We certainly do appreciate your time and space. God bless you all. We'll be doing more collaborations very soon. <clears throat> now. Here we are. I see two friendly faces that I recognize so we can. <laughs> Good to see the two of you. Um, we are now going to move to um, two of the uh, scholar practitioners at the university, thoroughly involved uh, in the uh, profit sector, both in teaching it and in activating their skills. Uh, we have Dr. Roseanne Marabella, professor of um, political science, who is the uh, intellectual uh, brainstorm behind many initiatives at the university, including uh, the Center for Community Renewal and Engagement, also partially responsible to the efforts of Tim Hoffman in getting many of the university core students and the students from Cree off campus uh, as they assist our community partners in various initiatives. And very recently, Dr. Jamila Davis has joined us as a, uh, a visiting a scholar and activist in residence at Cree. So my sisters, I welcome you this afternoon, and I'll just ask and remind you all that we have about 15 minutes uh, approximately for the two of you uh, to share your thoughts on the, uh, in your own way about what we need to know, what, uh, what kinds of activism, um, in a sense, um, should we be aware of in the nonprofit sector? And then we'll have about five minutes after that for any Q&A that would be placed in the chat. So sisters, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. And it's, it's indeed uh, my honor to have been invited to speak today at this wonderful event and also to be able to speak with my colleague, Jamila Davis, who is our first community practitioner in residence for CCRE. And we are working together to, to, to really move our communities through social change efforts. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, they can, Rose. OK, terrific. So I'm going to just briefly give you an overview about, you know, why why Dr. Pritchett invited us to speak today about the nonprofit sector and what this might have to do with the theme of the day with Martin Luther King Day. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about the, the the strong tradition of social justice in the nonprofit sector. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jamela, who will talk about some of the actual events that we're doing in the communities to bring these ideas to, to fruition. So social justice um, ha has had a long history uh, in the nonprofit sector. In the nonprofit sector, if you want to think about it, it's actually a group of people who come together because they see an issue in the community that needs resolution or needs solving or needs addressing and they they do something about it voluntarily and then oftentimes they'll form formal organizations so here's just a few examples that i put together for you so so child labor laws uh, in the early 1900s actually was an initiative that started in the nonprofit space when a national child labor committee was formed to expose the exploitation of children who were working in mines and factories and cotton mills. Similarly, in 1975, two women in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts opened a shelter called the Transition House for women who, would, who were battered by their husbands. And it's a nonprofit that's still operational today, and it brought this important issue to the government's uh, address. Another issue is the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children uh, was created after two men rescued a child from an abusive home and discovered there was no government agency responsible for protecting children. For today, I actually, if you look in the lower left hand corner of your screen, I actually brought a bit of a different twist on that because the um, ACS, which is the Agency for Child Services in New York City, actually, quite frankly, is probably quite racist. And so um, it's become very race child protective services. So a nonprofit that was formed to actually protect children, actually uh, the government agency actually removes children from their homes. And if you want to talk about that, you could take one of my classes because we discuss foster care and adoption quite a bit. And so social justice in the nonprofit sector has a long history. And why is that? Well, we call it in the field, the theory of market failure and government failure, which is when the nonprofit sector steps in 
to to um, address things that the other two sectors don't do. One because it's not profitable, and from the for, for the business sector and for the government sector because it is um, it's either not on their agenda or they they're, they they don't think it's that important to address. And so economists um, have referred to these gaps as market failure and government failure. So when the market fails to provide for individual needs such as battered women, the nonprofit sector steps in to fill the void. And when government fails to provide for vulnerable populations, as in the case of protecting children, the nonprofit sector steps in to fill the gap. And so it's a, it's a, what Burton Weisbrod said is now sort of a classic understanding of why why nonprofits. And so advocacy for social justice is a very strong strain within the nonprofit sector. And so we have seen over the past few years an explosion of third sector organizations that were created to advocate for social change from the Black Lives Matter movement to the Me Too campaign to the environmental movement. These are all nonprofit organizations that have formed together and they're activists who conduct letter writing campaigns. They raise money, they write opinion pieces, they advocate for legislative change and they take to the street to educate the public and to bring about social change. So advocacy and lobbying for social change are two of the most important roles that nonprofit organizations have historically played. And nonprofits enter the public policy arena as advocates or lobbyists in attempt to change public policy and public opinion in support of their organization's mission and their members desire. Now, lest we think that all nonprofits are created equal, and I'm listening to my colleague, Dr. Mott, give his presentation earlier, um, there are nonprofits of all shades and colors and stripes. And so um, Dr. Uh, Mott and I, I don't know if he mentioned this because I had to come in like I had another meeting. You know, we've actually written a piece on January 6th that many of the those deviants who were at that insurrection were actually a part of nonprofit organizations. So um, nonprofit organizations include the NRA, which spends millions of dollars lobbying for policies to support gun ownership and against policies that would limit its members' abilities to obtain firearms and lobbies against background checks. The American Federation for Teachers is a very strong lobby that spends millions of dollars on advocating um, against tenure reform in charter schools, both of which they oppose. Um, the uh, Nonprofit organizations are able to advocate and lobby. People think they're restricted, but they're not. And other nonprofits, as I said, include the Proud Boys and the um, the National, uh, the NCAA. And so the last thing I'm going to leave you with before I turn it over to my colleague, um, Dr. Davis, is one thing that nonprofits have to think about is how to bring about successful implementation in their advocacy efforts. And so there's a couple of things that I have up there on the screen that nonprofits can do uh, to build a foundation for social change and engaging stakeholders, seeing the current reality very clearly, making explicit choices about what's important and trying to bridge the gap between what you want to do and, and what you need to do. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Davis, who formed us, who joined us earlier this year in the Center for Community Research and Engagement. As, as a community practitioner, and we have been working collaboratively. I mean, Dr. Davis has been working for years in the community, but now gives us an opportunity as a university to work with her on her efforts to bring about social justice um, in this space. So Dr. Davis, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited to see it today um, on such a wonderful day about justice and change in America. So I just kind of want to uh, acquaint you that don't know me a little bit about my history. Um, I grew up in Queens, New York to two hardworking parents. Um, I got straight A's and then it was my high school years that I kind of went left. I wanted to be a cool kid chasing, you know, um, notoriety, chasing acceptance, really not feeling good enough about myself. And I ended up going the wrong route. And that wrong route actually led me to be sentenced in 2008 to serve a 12 and a half year sentence in federal prison for bank fraud. And that was where I had the rude awakening that, you know, my life wasn't on purpose. I was chasing the wrong things and I needed to get right with myself. And I went on a journey of self-discovery and through that journey with the help of my mother, who was an educator, um, you know, I learned about writing. I didn't know I had the gift to write. And I, I learned about resources primarily for women um, who are incarcerated. I noticed that there were none. 
So we were this population that was kind of thrown out and left to die. And there were not many resources to help us rehabilitate, you know? So um, through that process, I ended up creating the Voices of Consequences Enrichment Series to help incarcerated women heal, recognize their potential, and recapture their dreams. And that was my first stance that I had with actually nonprofits. I became the founder of Women Over Incarcerated, which is a nonprofit organization that creates awareness about who we are, women who commit crimes, and why. Right. And so that journey of getting into that led to me to get my PhD. My research was done in and around the trauma to prison pipeline, which specifically deals with women of color and why we commit crimes and different um, things that we need now to help us turn around. Um, and when I got out of prison, I started working strongly in the school system. As I mentioned to you before, I went left. Um, because I didn't really have the support I needed during those crucial years. So I, what I do now is I go into schools and I create programming to boost the esteem of um, teens. We also help them to tap into their gifts and their talents and become their greater self. So I became active in the community and I kind of show people, you know, that folks like me who are impacted, who have been through something, we, we have value. In the community, we have a role to play, you know, and we students listen to us. We have, you know, the street credibility and the things that are necessary to have communications in urban communities. Um, I also, through this work, became the lead director of the Schwepp program, which is East Orange's summer work experience program. I had the um, privilege to work with Dr. Rios, um, and we led 300 students for two summers now in classes around social justice and entrepreneurship. And the city was able to see the impact of our work. And you know, then we started working with the city of Newark and Mayor Ross Baraka, and which brings me now to Seton Hall, bringing community together. Um, and we have the social justice in action class where we take soldiers, frontline soldiers in community and activists, and we have principals and other leaders in the community, and we all come together to learn. And I think with um, this day being Dr. Martin Luther King's day, right, where he advocated so much for, for blacks and whites and just different people to come together, you know, as community and how effective that would be. And for us to be able to do that at Seton Hall, where this year we gave away $6,000 to students from the community who were able to build projects on activism, things that concerned them. We had a whole curriculum around how to activate your voice and how they mattered. And just them coming to Seton Hall, they said, being in a place where they thought that they would never maybe even be accepted or belonged and they got their seat at the table. It was such a different experience for them that it raised their esteem and the support of the university and the provost and the deans and all the people that came out to support them. They felt like for once that they mattered. So that's the power of social justice. That's the power of collab collaboration. And when we come together as community, we can achieve more. So I'll turn it back over to you to, you know, I don't know if you guys want to have a question and that question and answer session about some of the work, but I think that gives a brief overview about what we do and its importance. Excellent. Thank you, sisters. You brought a lot of vim and vigor and, and authenticity into what you are sharing with us. So we're going to ask if anyone has a direct question, please place post it in the chat so that uh, we all can read it together and respond to it. But indeed, you all are on the cutting edge, I believe, of the uh, 21st century paradigms uh, when it comes to not only community engagement, but community empowerment. I was muted. Before we turned it on to the next group, at the end of the day, were you going to remind people about the National Day of Healing tomorrow? Can you please do that, Roseanne? Just go right ahead. Yeah, yeah so I, tomorrow I um, is the, a National Day of Healing, Racial Healing, and Seton Hall is having an event at um, 11 o'clock. And you can you can email me to get the um, the link to that if you would like. And there's a little registration that's required, but we're bringing in um, Dr. Stephanie Williams from the Amistad Commission in the state of New Jersey to talk about uh, the commission's um, uh, 
goals to integrate African American history through the K through 12 curriculum in the state of New Jersey. And we're going to be talking to her about how the university might assist in that effort in that regard. And if you'd like to come and hear more about the Amistad Commission and participate in our National Day of Healing, send me a note or actually, I think I'll put, can I put it in the chat? Can I put the yes, registration in the chat? Okay, so I'll put the registration link in the link chat. Right off the university calendar would be uh, yeah. great. Oh, true. Okay, thank you. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. I had it in my notes at the very end, but uh, I will repeat that. Okay. Else. Are there any questions? You know, everyone should understand that during uh, life in America is hard enough in a racial and socioeconomic sense. Uh, it has been exacerbated over the last two years by the presence of the pandemic. Uh, I, I've been saying for the last two years to my friends when I uh, greet them, I hope you are surviving the pandemic in the air and the pandemic on the ground, which is where many of us find ourselves all the time, looking up. Okay. All right, seeing no questions, we wanna thank you all very, very, very much for taking your time uh, to be with us on this very significant day. And we pray that you have planted seeds in the minds of the 50 or more students who are signed up for the credit, who are doing analysis, uh, at, of each of the presentations as they capture these nuggets. So, and so um, Dr. Pritchett, if any of your students, any of the students attending today want to get involved in our social justice work on campus, shoot me yes. a note to uh, send, send me an email. We have volunteers all the time who are working with us in the community. So if you're interested in doing that kind of work, reach out. We'd love to have you. All right, you heard it, everyone. All right, thank you, Jamila and Roseanne. We're gonna be moving on now to two other colleagues, and uh, I hope they both are in the house. I did see uh, Brother Juan at some point, um, and um, there he is. And there's Anthony, excellent. All right, so we, we're calling now upon two of our colleagues who I know have been doing extremely uh, relevant work uh, not only in the classroom, but in the laboratory we call life out in the community. And it's so important that uh, we have that type of relevance. So I've asked them to collaborate and to, in the most uh, befitting way that would honor Dr. King's legacy and, and also show our stewardship over the uh, spaces that have been created for us and how we and some are creating um, new perspectives. Um, we build upon history, but we know that we are touching the next generation. So without further ado, I am pleased to uh, present to everyone from our social work department, Dr. Anthony Nicotera and Dr. Juan Rios, who will now be our presenters. I remind to my brothers that we're talking about um, 10 to 15 minutes total for uh, both presentations, and then another five minutes for Q&A be fine. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, what a privilege and uh, honor it is to be a part of this beloved community and to present today and to learn with you. Deep peace and gratitude to all, in particular to Reverend Dr. Forrest Pritchett and all of our presenters, organizers, and participants today. Again, uh, I'm here with my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Juan Rios, I'm going to begin uh, presenting and then pass the torch uh, to Dr. Rios. Uh, in addition to teaching, and again, my name is Anthony Nicotera, in addition to teaching in Seton Hall's social work program with Dr. Rios, I'm privileged to help lead the Fellowship of Reconciliation, or FOR, the nation's oldest, largest multi-faith peace and justice organization of which Dr. King was a member. I'm going to share some slides with you now. Uh, just a moment ago when I shared the slides, I had a little trouble hearing, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to uh, see and hear them. If you cannot, please uh, let us know in the chat.
And as the slides hopefully come up now and the slideshow begins, I'd like to share just a few brief stories related to Dr. King's call to us in the fierce urgency of now to build beloved community rooted in a radical revolution in values, a radical redist redistribution of political and economic power, a revolution rooted in what Dr. King called the most durable power, love. Love that labors for justice and works tirelessly to dismantle the triple evils of racism, militarism, and materialism, and all isms that would oppress, reify, and dehumanize the other. For the other, even the enemy for Dr. King must be seen for who she or he is, sister, brother, self. Social worker, FOR member, Vietnamese Buddhist monk and Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, also known as Thai, meaning teacher, was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1967. I had the privilege of working with Thai to create a film that tells the story of his friendship with Dr. King and how they mutually inspired one another in their work for peace and justice. Across cultures, across faith traditions, across oceans and nations that would divide them, Dr. King and Ty became brothers in the beloved community, and this book has just come out, highly recommend it to you. Knowing that they were inextricably connected, knowing that their liberation was bound up together, they worked together for peace and justice. And as Ty would say, we are here to awaken from our illusion of separateness. And Dr. King would add, all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. In 1967, in the spirit of this network of mutuality and interconnection, what Ty refers to as our interbeing, he invited Dr. King to speak out against the war in Ty's home country of Vietnam. Dr. King did so prophetically a year to the day before his assassination, April 4th, 1967 at Riverside Church in New York City in what is often referred to as his Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence or Radical Revolution in Values speech. In this pandemic moment, in this moment of racial reckoning and political polarization, this moment of climate crisis, to work for social justice, to awaken, from the illusion of our separateness to weave our single garment of destiny to build beloved community, we must understand that there comes a time when silence is betrayal. Here is a clip from the award-winning mixed media film I mentioned that I helped produce in collaboration with Ty, which will be re-released as the Five Powers Revolution in April of 2022. It highlights Dr. King's call to us today in the fierce urgency of now to break silence. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Thich Nhat Hanh met personally only on a few occasions. Their first meeting was in Chicago in May of 1966, where they held a press conference to offer proposals to end the war. One year later, Dr. King delivered one of his most famous speeches and his first to publicly question the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. The time has come for America to hear the truth about this tragic war. I've chosen to preach about the war in Vietnam today because I agree with Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. I hope you heard that. Uh, for some reason, I'm not hearing the volume, but <clears throat> hopefully you did. Uh, Dr. King also worked with the Fellowship of Reconciliation to create a comic book, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. In our film, we tell the story of this comic. It inspired Representative John Lewis as a boy, and it inspired him to create his graphic novel trilogy as an adult, March and Run. And if you haven't checked them out, you should. 
It continues to inspire young people and countless persons fighting for justice, truth, and liberation globally. Here's a short clip from our film featuring the MLK and the Montgomery Story comic. In 1956, following the famed Montgomery bus boycott, Alfred Hassler had the idea to create a comic book to illustrate the ongoing struggle for social justice. Alfred worked directly with Martin Luther King Jr. on the content. I always thought, like many people who learn history in a class, Brother Anthony, I think the sound went out. In the classroom, my image of the Montgomery bus boycott is Rosa Parks on the bus, Dr. King in front of a podium, the big names. Rarely did I think of a comic book as a shaper of that civil rights struggle. It was a mere five months after Rosa Parks' unbelievable moment of nonviolent resistance that Alfred Hassler wrote a letter starting the project. Alfred Hassler says this is the idea, a comic book to be distributed in the South to tell the story of Montgomery for young people, African Americans, white Americans. It was novel. The idea itself was groundbreaking. He persuaded the Al Cap Studios, famous cartoonist studios, to do the drawings for free. It was about the principles of nonviolent resistance and how it works. So this helped to bring out the story of what was going on in Montgomery, of the idea of nonviolent resistance to segregation in this case. This comic book was produced in 1958, at the very beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. I also started to realize this comic book wasn't something from the past, it's something in the present. I realized it had been translated into Arabic in 2003, 2004. And that spurred my interest in the, in the fact that it's actually being used in Arab Spring. And I got in touch with some of these revolutionaries and activists in Egypt. And they've been using this comic book as a tool to teach young Egyptians about the power of nonviolence. This comic book turned Martin Luther King into a superhero. To me, this is such a wonderful example of having faith in your actions, whether or not they produce the result that you think they're going to. As you may know, in April 1968, Dr. King was in Memphis to meet and march with sanitation workers as part of his Poor People's Campaign when he was assassinated. In collaboration with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, Dr. King's Poor People's Campaign continues today. Justice is like running a relay. You run your circle and then you pass the baton. Martin is not getting up out of the grave. We must be the runner in front that reaches back. Dr. King was a man for the people, you know. One of the last things that he worked on was the Poor People's Campaign. We have an obligation to keep that going. And I think there's a lot of Dr. Kings like all over the country. Poor People's Campaign was trying to make sure that people had a decent standard of living no matter where they were in this country. The work of Dr. King clearly isn't finished. As a veteran that has sworn oath to this country, has served this country, to see so many people in poor and desperate situations uh, to see racism rising again in America, it hurts. But witnessing the unity of people from all walks of life, we're gonna eventually win. They, you can't not win. They never told us to keep honoring their work. They told us, continue it. That's why we gotta have a poor people's camp. With Dr. King, with the Poor People's Campaign, with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, with Thich Nhat Hanh, and with sisters and brothers suffering, struggling, striving for justice, peace, and liberation in our nation and our world together, let us break silence and respond to Dr. King's clarion call to beloved community. As Dr. King implores, now let us begin. Let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. 
I now invite my friend, colleague, scholar, fellow social worker, transformative leader, Dr. Juan Rios, who engages Dr. King's beautiful struggle in the fierce urgency of now at Seton Hall, in his work in South Orange and Newark, he's worked with the NBA and beyond to share some of his story and work. Dr. Rios. Thank you so much, Brother Anthony Nicotero. Thank you so much. Um, first and foremost, uh, I want to show my gratitude to Baba Pritchett for once again putting together another well, fantastic, successful symposium, truly reaching um, all within our campus community and abroad about the importance of the work and, and of, of, of Dr. King. And as we've just seen, it's not that it's over, it is the continuation. Uh, so now as we think about what is next, um, you've heard from uh, particularly folks such as uh, Dr. Roseanne Mirabella, Dr. Jamila Davis, and their work with the Center of Community Engagement, uh, the Center for Community Engagement Research, uh, who, where I'm also a scholar in residence. I want to begin to talk about what are some of the, uh, the, the, the work that our community is doing next. So, uh, Brother Nicotero, I'm not sure if you can move to the next slide. Yeah, I'm trying, but it's not letting me let me reshare my apologies no worries okay here we go Is that good? Uh, yes, absolutely. Great. Great. Thanks. Yep. My Thank you so much, brother. So I want to start off with a quote by Dr. King, which is uh, faith is taking the first step when you can't see the top of the staircase. So, so often we feel like everything has to be done perfectly in order for us to make these moves, but we have to trust and have hope that the micro emergent strategies that we're implementing now will lead us to more structural and major changes. Um, and uh, next slide, Dr. Nicotera. So the first thing we to, need to ask ourselves is what does community mean to me? What does that look like for me? So in one word, I invite uh, everyone really to put in the chat box right now, what is one word that really symbolizes community for you? So I'm gonna take a few seconds to allow that to populate in the chat box. So we have solidarity, safety, unity, absolutely. Support, yes. There's 75 of us, so there should be 75 uh, responsive. Cohesiveness, communication, personality, home, I love that. Yes, absolutely, connection, surroundings. And as the 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 chats keep popping up. Uh, Brother Nicotero, go to the next slide. We think of accountability, beautiful. So all of these areas that we're thinking about, trust. Uh, we as a community co-design what that looks like, and either it will be designed for us, or we have to intentionally, intentionally, put ourselves in positions where we can engage directly our community to have that voice to co-construct those changes. And one of the theoretical models that's really behind uh, a lot of the work that, that's been done is really taking it from a liberation liberation health model perspective. And it's true. this is really truly the practice in which individuals, groups, communities um, understand the personal, cultural, and institutional factors that contribute to their problem and we we get them to and we engage them to act to change these conditions so to liberate both themselves from the external and internal oppression so if community means trust for community is very different trust for some and then for others so there's the internal levels of oppression so when i as a racialized embodied black man driving through specific neighborhoods is the internalized oppression of how I feel about certain spaces and the internalized policies and that exist that keep me and continue to reinforce those internalized levels of oppression. Uh, next slide, Brother Nicotera. 
And this really plays a role into community health and wellness. So the CDC defines what we think about the social determinants, to determinants of health into five categories, economic stability, education, health and healthcare, neighborhood built environment, social community context. Uh, next slide. So what does this look like? Just look like when we're thinking about economic stability, is there a disproportionate inequity amongst unemployment? Is there a disproportionate inequity amongst food access and food securities? Is there a disproportionate inequities that exist in my community? Let's go back to, the, to what we define as community. Someone said accountability. Let's hold that piece, right? We hold ourselves and our communities accountable for any of these inequities. Because as in Dr. Nicotero's presentation, silence is complicit. It's being complicit. We can no longer be silent. It's betrayal. So is there inequities within uh, healthcare? Uh, uh, Dr. Mott mentioned about the inequities uh, regarding the empathy of um, um, w amongst uh, uh, black women who are being seen regarding uh, medication management. Is there an inequity in our built community about regarding uh, parks and green spaces? So now let's keep uh, next slide, uh, Dr. Nicotera. So all of those areas create create disparity health outcomes uh, regarding the mortality of folks living in specific communities, as well as uh, chronic health conditions that contribute to the loss and lowering of quality of life. Uh, in, in, in the community of South Orange, uh, post the murder of George Floyd, um, Mayor Sheeta Collum had called upon the community to come up with solutions in regards to how could we address as a community uh, some of the inequities and also challenges that, was, that, that are currently happening in South Orange. Um, and as we all have heard before, this, 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 this horrific notion that you, when you come out of campus, you don't turn right, you turn left, right? And what we want or trying to do is really be able to change this narrative that what happens in South Orange implicates and affects our, our, our neighbors, our visitors, and residents, which includes South Orange, East Orange, uh, uh, um, uh, Irvington, Maplewood as well, and that the policies and how we build compassion within the community impacts all of our community, which includes our visitors and neighbors. Now, therefore, South Orange uh, has a bottle that says everyone belongs here. But we want to push that further and say, are we living beyond our lawn signs? That is not just a message that looks great or not just a, 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 a yellow uh, 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 painted street. How do we truly move beyond that when, with, with care and compassion that creates inter personal connectedness, as we've seen cohesion and belongingness that someone mentioned about community and, and continuously push that forward, whether it's 911 diversions or whether it's education into the community or whether it's racial healing. Um, uh, next slide, Bonnie Katera. So the work that we've done in South Orange is building together an initiative called the Community Care and Justice Initiative, and which is truly a care and compassion platform in which we are embedding more care and compassion through programming, 911 divergence, care and case management, education, both in and outside of schools, um, in order to build and create more cohesiveness, whether it's racial healing circles, or whether it's uh, restorative justice programs, or whether it's more visibility amongst uh, 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 community members and leaders, so we could destigmatize what wellness and health looks like for others, uh, and truly be able to place a strong emphasis to our, our most vulnerable populations. Our next slide, Brother Nicotera. Which also means that South Orange community has to be stronger partners within our neighbors in Newark, in particular. As we know, um, during the 1967 Newark Rebellion, uh, Precinct 1 was the epicenter of where a lot of the violence had occurred uh, pertaining to the police injustices to the Newark community members and was the stand in which the community stated, no longer will we continue to allow uh, in silence, 
uh, of not taking any more of the injustices that are happening within our community. And the precinct one has for many years been a symbol of that, uh, uh, of the injustice, the racial injustice that was happening in, within the city of Newark. After post the murder of George Floyd, the Mayor Riles Baraka had diverted $11 million from public safety to create the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery. And this office is a new office of city government in which rather than looking at uh, the problem as whether it's gun violence or whether it's community violence or or it's a personal uh, 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 issues of domestic violence and homelessness, let's get to the root. Let's get to the root of the trauma that's existing within our community, whether it's inner, intra or interpersonal trauma that has existed and really could think about what is upstream, not looking at pulling people out of uh, the river, but really looking at how are people falling into the river as a quote by the late Desmond Tutu. And the, 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 the work within the Office of Violence Prevention had truly speaks to looking at it from a trauma-informed lens, not what is wrong with you, but rather what has happened to you, which includes structural and, 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 and uh, 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 intergener intergenerational uh, uh, forms of oppression. Uh, next slide, Brother Nicotera. So here are some of the solutions in which, doc, which, in which we're involved in with the Office of Violence Prevention. Uh, one, the mayor has created uh, uh, a, 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 a museum in which social justice work and, and activism will be promoted and highlighted, really shifting the narrative within the community. And as, as Dr. Nicotera presented within uh, his presentation of Dr. King being immortalized through a comic book, we need to also continue to 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 recognize our our heroes of today and the work that that's being done locally. That this is not just this is not just a, a story that happened uh, 40, 50 years ago. This is a story of us now. This is a story of you. So as you leave today's symposium, I want you all to be able to walk away with what is my role into what's next to the community? What is it that I can move towards and do directly? And, and also, uh, uh, lastly here, regarding the uh, uh, different activities uh, that, that, that the Mayor Ros Baraka has uh, created is one to refunding the People Project. And this is in which Dr. Uh, Jamila Davis was directly involved and, 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 and really truly empowered the most at-risk at -risk individuals within the city of Newark into uh, entrepreneurship training, uh, knowledge of self training, mental health first aid, uh, building mutual aid, and empowering them to create and cultivate solutions in which they themselves want to see in their community. Uh, next slide. And we utilize a model which is the collective efficacy model. That's when communities come together by recognizing what the perceived injustices are. How does it play a role into my identity? And what is my belief in being able to change that which exists to move us towards collective action? So when Dr. Jamila Davis mentioned about the social justice and action program that we developed and created, this is to really empower credible messengers, folks with lived experiences in our communities to be able to activate, empower, and move through change by co-designing what does safety look like for me? What does health and wellness and belongingness look like? So that we move towards a collective act action of trust, wellness, belongingness, and safety. That was mentioned in the beginning of the slides. Therefore, when we think of love in action, it is a movement. We think of its root, root word of what? Of, of, of emotion and motivation. It all has the same rooted Latin term, okay? Which is to move. So whether it's our emotions have to move in order for us to move through the process of change or what motivates us, moves us through the process of a collective well society. Last slide, Brother Nicotera. 
And I want to close off here uh, with a quote as it, as it comes up. And this is a quote by Sister Asada Shakur. And I think it's very fitting as we begin to really sit with what's next for each and every one of us as we, we, we really contemplate on the work and legacy of Dr. King. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. You see that? Air protection. We cannot talk about love without standing up for one another when it's most difficult, when it's not easy, when I'm uncomfortable. So we can tear down these structures of imperialism, patriarchy, racism, all the all the isms, all the phobias that exist, homophobia, transphobia. So we could move towards love and embracing each other, but also fighting to protect each other as we build community. Because what? We have nothing to lose but our chains. And with that, I close. And uh, Brother Nicotero, I hand it over to you. I'm just grateful, and I'm going to hand it over to Reverend Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. My, my good brothers, Juan and Anthony. Um, I was taking a look at the uh, chat just to make sure that if anybody had been so stimulated by your presentation that we did not overlook uh, any uh, comments or questions that were coming in. Had not seen any, but thank you all for that. Um, I would say well balanced, but by balanced, you were bringing in uh, energy from many different arenas. That's greatly appreciated. But one of the things that was absolutely very clear from the beginning of your presentation, how history of the past that many people were not even aware of is impacting the present. And you might even call it almost the Asian connection. Um, you know, in one sense, we view Dr. King almost one dimensionally uh, in terms of what he said and did uh, relative to Vietnam. And then on the other hand, you're revealing some of the precursors to that uh, built upon friendship, brotherhood, and trust. So he was being very true to a covenant established with Sikhnam. And that, that's um, something we can all grow upon, the value of trusting relationships in a good space. So brothers, thank you once again. And uh, God bless as you move forward. And uh, always, if I can do anything, I'm more, I'll be there for you. Thank you We're so now going to uh, move to our last segment of the afternoon. And I'm going to be calling forth uh, Dr. Balkin and uh, some of the fellows of the, um, the Center for Faculty Development. And what we have in mind here is, you know, for the last several years, um, in light of certain types of uh, requests and needs that were emerging on the campus, uh, the Center of, for Faculty Development took on um, a number of new in initiatives or additional initiatives and uh, some dealing with uh, getting faculty or encouraging faculty to place um, some emphasis upon uh, infusing of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion types of uh, items into their various coursework and other related matters. So I'm so pleased right now uh, to introduce this cohort uh, to all of us, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Balkin, who will get us rolling. Thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Um, I appreciate it. And these were all very tough acts to follow, obviously. Um, I would like to thank Forrest for asking me to, to put together this session. Um, I'm with the English department. I'm also the director of uh, the Center for Faculty Development, which sponsors a lot of diversity initiatives, um, all of which uh, yeah, uh, these people have taken part in. They haven't taken part in all of them, but each one of them has taken part in at least one, if not more. Uh, we have a seminar in diversity and teaching for inclusion. There's an anti-racist pedagogy workshop, 
diversity film series, diversity reading group, and the diversity coalition. So I've invited, um, I invited five people. Unfortunately, Dr. Johnston was not able to stick around. Um, so he sends his apologies. Um, but um, I have four other colleagues here. Uh, Professor Natalie Neubauer, who's with the Department of Speech Language Pathology. Uh, Professor Mark Harwitz with the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work and Criminal Justice. <laughs> Professor David Laviska, Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And Professor Gail Vignola, Department of English. So if uh, we could just go through, and I've adjusted the order just a little bit. Um, so uh, Natalie, uh, so we've asked them um, to talk about how this work has impacted their teaching um, and and what they do in the classroom. So um, actually, before we start, Forrest, um, I had asked if you would be willing to say a few words about um, Martin Luther King Jr. and his his ideas about about education. So I don't know if you want to start there. Or would you want to? Sure. Well, I, I'll um, just mm -hmm. take one quote from Dr. King uh, that is probably uh, most quoted uh, by many many people, but. You know, so often in a, a Western democratic society with a university, you know, uh, people want to go to college, mm -hmm. perhaps not for the enhancement of self by intellect, but for the, the financial gain for the pocket. So I, the quote I would pull from Dr. King would be that mm -hmm. uh, the true purpose of education is to build character. Mm -hmm. And um, so with that in mind, it's like saying, what else do we need to be doing Mm -hmm. other than someone studying religion or philosophy uh, or psychology to look at character. Uh, but I would probably say for some of us, the moral development of students, uh, mm -hmm. having students to understand that it's you and I should not be defined by simply by the work that we do and or the money that we make, but about our relationships and perhaps caring for our brothers and sisters and the earth. So Mary, I'll leave it right there. That would that would be Dr. King's perspective. Thank you so much, Forrest. Um, so before we turn to um, to Professor Newbar, I also wanted to just mention that this is um, this session basically speaks to the kind of work that is being done here. Somebody had posted a question or a statement to that effect in the chat. Not that the work is done by a long shot, and we all know that, but that work is happening, especially at the curricular and at the classroom level. So um, Natalie, I'm going to start with you. Thank you for the introductions. Um, so as Dr. Balkin mentioned, I am in the master's speech language pathology program. I did participate in the seminar on racism and inclusion, as well as the advanced seminar, which she had mentioned. Um, before I get started in talking about what I've done in the classroom, there are a couple of quotes that sort of did resonate with me. Uh, Martin Luther King quotes and wanted to talk about um, my philosophies on social justice. Um, so one of the first ones um, that really kind of stood out to me was a genuine genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. So really in the classroom, I teach students to respect and consider differing perspectives and really the unique contributions of others in decision making. So, you know, instead of providing one lens, it is really powerful to challenge your viewpoint and broaden your scope of, th of thinking by seeking to understand that there are views really outside of your own. Um, also, um, there were two other quotes. Um, Nothing in all of the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Um, important to me is to really increase awareness of students to um, challenges faced by different racial groups related to inclusion and social justice, and to really be vulnerable and to recognize the biases they have and limitations in knowledge, and really have that passion and desire to be a change agent, um, and to understand the value and importance to strive for social justice. So so not to only make change, but to understand the issues that are happening before you can really kind of make that next step forward. In terms of my philosophies on social justice, I frame classroom time as an opportunity uh, to help in the unlearning of some oppressive uh, thought processes and behaviors. I tell students to never let their education get in the way of their learning, to really have humility, accept feedback, and change their direction as necessary. Um, and you'll see as I talk through really quickly the things I do in the classroom, I provide a myriad of teaching clinical training opportunities and hands-on immersive learning uh, for students to really gain competencies in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that way they can collaborate with peers and colleagues of diverse cultural and linguistic backgrounds and really engage in best practices 
in terms of social justice and working with the clients and the families that they serve. So for me, the first step is creating a culturally respectful classroom. So a collaborative classroom um, where everyone, obviously their viewpoint is acknowledged, developing intercultural skills through equal participation of all um, for students uh, to get to know uh, each other's cultural beliefs, as well as the beliefs of the professor and really understand how beliefs influence behavior um, and really gain that cross-cultural competence uh, to express their opinions and share experiences with empathy, listening, uh, and perspective taking, holding meaningful discussions. Um, some of the things that I do is I hold a social justice and diversity training boot camp. So we review cultural humility, cultural responsive teaching. We talk about microaggressions, anti-racism, and inclusion strategies. I do a diversity training where I teach students about sensitive issues that may arise in their professional practice um, that could kind of bring out a strong emotional response and we talk through that. We also do journal clubs, Seton Hall Libraries. I want to make a pitch for them. There is a lot of great resources online that you can pull from there, have students uh, review those articles and then come back for reflective practice through journal clubs. Um, another thing um, I have found in my own uh, profession and I'm sure in other professions they're there are um, YouTube course series on microaggressions. So I have the students review those um, and then through the chat we reflect on new things that they've learned. We do clinical case study reviews. Um, so we have that, I illustrate how unexamined stereotypes become inflexible over time. We look at forms of discrimination and how they can apply some of their anti-racism and inclusion strategies when working with um, clients and families that they serve. Um, another thing which is really interesting is I have them complete cultural competence and culturally responsive checklists where they kind of look and they review um, considerations in terms of families backgrounds, cultural practices, child rearing practices, things that they would need to know um, for their fields um, in terms of dealing with clients and their families. Another thing I've taken from um, Dr. Balkin is the wonderful Harvard implicit bias test, um, which I have my students complete that as well. Um, we do role playing exercises um, where we bring up scenarios, case studies for conflict resolution skills. And the last thing I want to mention, which I think is super cool, is I actually do a cultural diversity standardized patient simulation. Um, so these are um, theater actors who actually portray different disabilities. And I have my students go through um, a diagnostic experience um, with the client and their family where they have to report out test results uh, to the parents. It's the first time they're ever hearing it and they have to provide counseling and education while using the strategies that they've learned in terms of diversity and inclusion because the family case is a, a, a family from a, um, um, minority background. Um, so these are just some examples of the things that I do um, in uh, the SLP program in our diagnostic and our clinical coursework. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Natalie. Wow, it sounds fabulous. I like that last part especially. So our next uh, speaker is Mark Horowitz. And uh, Mark comes to the seminar every semester. He has come from the beginning um, to share some of the work that he does on um, the way that political orientation is predictive of how sociologists study race. I'm sure, and I know there are other things that he does in his classes, but he really brings such value to the seminar that I wanted him to, to speak today. Welcome, Mark. Well, thank you, Mary. Too many people to thank, certainly Dr. Pritchett and, and Mary and everybody, all the speakers today. It's been wonderful, I've learned a lot. Uh, as Mary just said, I participated a number of years in the race seminar, diversity seminar. Uh, learned a lot from my colleagues there. It's uh, certainly inspiring to to interact with people so committed to issues of justice and racial justice, uh, not only in our pedagogy, but in society as a whole. Um, I wanted to hit on a couple aspects of uh, King's legacy that I think are quite important today um, and might be, if not neglected, not given the attention I think they merit. And uh, the first is uh, a bit controversial, and it's this idea that King late in life and uh, uh, gravitated increasingly toward uh, some form of democratic socialism. Uh, King started to understand that capitalism as a form of economic organization is uh, particularly dehumanizing and leads to a whole manner of unintended negative consequences. And uh, I could have called many, many different quotes to this effect. I just have one 
on the top of the PowerPoint here, and I, I will be returning just a heads up to my pedagogy. It'll be in connection to this. Um, so King writes uh, in his letter to Coretta Scott King, I imagine you already know that I'm much more socialistic in my economic theory than capitalistic. Capitalism started out with a noble and high motive, but like most human systems, it fell victim to the very thing it was revolting against. So today capitalism has outlived its usefulness. So this criticism of capitalism, which is integral to my own critical sociology, certainly inspired in part by King's legacy, is a crucial part of what uh, King advocated. And the second part of his legacy, which I think is very, very important, is the idea that we, we sort of strive to overcome the impulse, which is quite human, for us to really hate our enemies. And it's obviously a biblical injunction for us to love our enemies. Uh, we aspire to that, but it's quite difficult. And for many of us who look at the injustices around us, the inequalities around us, we feel disgust and anger. It's all too human to want to put a human face on the enemy that is bringing about these problems, right? Um, what I would suggest is that King was deeply committed to the idea of trying to love those people and to even understand them. And this is one, again, of numerous quotes I could have uh, called for this. Uh, King states, uh, here is the true meaning and value of compassion and nonviolence. When it helps us to see the enemy's point of view, to hear their questions, to know their assessment of ourselves. Uh, for from their view, we may indeed see the basic weaknesses of our own condition. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers and sisters who are called the opposition. So this idea that we could actually learn from people who we strongly disagree with uh, is something that King articulated quite often. And it's not not mentioned, I think, uh, strongly enough. And I, I added, uh, just to sort of highlight the point, a quote by uh, the great philosopher John Stuart Mill, uh, who wrote, uh, they who know, they, it should be they who know, only their own side of the case, know little of that. Okay, so if you only know your own point of view, you're not very likely to, to know the other side either. And, and the reason I included this image here of a fist in a rose, that's actually the image of the Socialist International, and uh, what it symbolizes, at least to me, is this idea that if we're going to bring about a just world, if we're going to be confronting the inequities and injustices of our capitalist social order, that we, we're not going to win unless we conjoin two fundamental impulses. And the fist, which has been certainly highlighted today, is that we're going to have to struggle. Uh, this is something where we're looking at a world of inequality and injustice, and there are many people who benefit from the existing status quo who aren't simply going to relinquish their power willingly. So uh, we have to organize and we have to get into the community and we have to struggle for this. Um, and that's an indispensable aspect of what social change means, I think, in King's legacy. But there's also the rose. And we're not going to win through fighting alone, as important as fighting it is. We're going to win if we join fighting with love. So we have to love our fellow human being. We have to bring and embody the highest moral values to our social struggles. And the hardest, I would argue, moral value to bring to the struggles is seeing the other side and not demonizing them. We have to resist the temptation to hate people whose ideas are so repugnant to us that we never want to give them a chance. And this brings me to my pedagogy. This is certainly a message. And I, I should say that Dr. Anthony Hainer, a colleague of mine, has been integrally involved in this work as well and has had a very positive influence on my deeply communitarian impulse that I think King embodies. So this very, very briefly, um, uh, in, in light of my work in the diversity seminar, I'm increasingly organizing my senior seminar, my sociology of knowledge and other classes around the idea of inviting ideas that may not resonate with us, but they're so, so important, especially today in a context of so much social and political polarization. Uh, we have to recognize, for example, um, the importance of viewpoint diversity in higher education. Um, many, many of our students do not necessarily share the progressive values that most of the professoriate, and I, I, I include myself in that, uh, bring to the classroom. So this is just one example. I, I reorganized my senior seminar to include a central emphasis on race. One of the three options the students can focus on is uh, the question of the roots of racial inequality and what should be done about it. So they choose one of the books from the top there, um, the Ibram Kendi, uh, Jomo Luo, and Michelle Alexander. They have to critically interrogate that book, examine its hypotheses and assumptions, and yet then they also have to choose one from the bottom list. And, and many students of the progressive bent may find this difficult, uh, but I think extremely important and rewarding for them to delve into. So writers like Thomas Sowell, Wilfred Riley, or Jason Riley, these are speakers who have couldn't have a more diametrically opposed point of view to the claims and the spirit and the values of many of us as we struggle for social justice. But in the end, I think if people do engage those ideas, it enables us as 
as teachers to be able to reach students who bring to the classroom different values. And if we show that we're giving them a fair hearing and we're engaging them on fair terms, to go back to King's point, we might actually learn mm -hmm. something from mm -hmm. them as well. So th thank you again, Mary, for inviting me along. Thank you so much, Mark, for agreeing. Thank you for coming. Um, so David LaVisca is, um, is going to speak next. Thank you, David. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Mary. Um, thank you, uh, Reverend Pichette, for this uh, unbelievable day. Um, I, it's just been incredibly motivational and, and interesting and uplifting. And uh, I feel very fortunate to, to have had the opportunity to listen to so many phenomenal people speak. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Um, so my pedagogical approach is certainly uh, different from what you've heard from a lot of uh, other people, most specifically the two, uh, Natalie and Mark, who spoke right before I did. Um, but I wanted to say a few words just in general uh, about my field and about my own experience. Um, issues of diversity, equity and inclusion have been at the forefront for me my entire career. Uh, as a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, uh, I, I was very isolated when I was an undergraduate student. I grew up in an extremely one dimensional, um, very, very white upstate New York community. Uh, so my own experience, uh, I'm from a blue collar household. Uh, I'm a first generation student. So my own experience was of pretty much constantly being othered all throughout uh, my education, up through my undergraduate education. And um, so that has been in the back of my mind, and I won't go through my entire career trajectory, but I teaching is a second career for me. Uh, this is, I think, officially my 10th year of full-time teaching. Uh, it's not even been nine years since I defended my PhD. So uh, I had a first career with the uh, Environmental Protection Agency before I switched entirely and started something else. Um, but uh, as an organometallic chemist, uh, I'm following my passion from a scholarship standpoint um, and discovered a passion for teaching on the side. And the reason that I went this route really was because I remembered the lack of diversity in my field from when I was younger and the things that I experienced in all the various um, roadblocks, if you will, that were either real or perceived on my part because of my otherness. So um, I was fortunate to join Seton Hall in 2017 and then um, because of Mary and then also Anthony, um, I participated in the teaching for inclusivity thing, which is uh, about two years ago. That was spring of 2020. Uh, we were all together as the pandemic set in, unfortunately. And um, and then in that fall, uh, also the Challenging Racism series. And I just want to say, first of all, uh, how grateful I am and how grateful we should all be as a community that these sorts of initiatives are in place. Uh, they opened my mind to many, many things. It, it's, it was a fantastic way for me to feel like I could learn in a um, compassionate, welcoming uh, place where I could try out ideas and listen to things. And I learned as much from my colleagues and their impressions and thoughts and what they shared as I did from the extensive readings. Uh, my bookshelf is much larger and more full now because of all the books that I bought based on the readings that we did and the people that I started learning about. And I have a long, long way to go and a lot to learn. But um, I am grateful for that. And, you know, in my field, uh, the natural sciences are historically very Anglo-European dominated. Um, there's no question about that. And I think at Seton Hall, um, Reverend Pichette, brought up two incredibly important things right at the start of this segment. And one was um, the money versus moral part of what we study. And in the sciences, uh, it's very typical that students have the money part of it really sort of close to their consciousness. Um, and then the second thing is uh, the quote that you brought up, uh, Reverend, was in my, it's in my syllabus. That's a, is it literally the quote that I put in my syllabus. I've been putting it in there for years. Um, and so as my teaching has evolved before these workshops, 
Uh, I have been trying to help students connect to their communities anyway, because I think that that's a better way to learn. I think it helps students understand science, which may be somewhat oblique to them if they can connect it to the world around them and their communities. Um, and there are some great initiatives, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, including the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And these things are talking about global community. There was some discussion earlier about community in, in the chat. And I think that that gives students a sense of connection. Um, and based on my work in these symposia, these series uh, as organized by Dr. Balkan, I have included some other things now in my classes, including actually asking students to research scientists from underrepresented communities of all sorts um, so that they can see that they exist and that it's not only old Eurocentric uh, white guys, right? And that it's not all one point of view. Um, so. And then the last thing I'll say um, before I close is that um, I think one of the most important things any of us can do is show up as our authentic selves. So I try to have as few um, screens between myself and my students as possible. Um, there need to be boundaries, of course, um, but I am very open about my sexuality, about my personal life, about my experiences, about my first career, my second career, my own failures as a student, and so on, as well as my own um, gaps in my knowledge. And many of those uh, involve issues of DEI, um, DEIR. So I've been working on that for a number of years. Um, I have been presenting on it within the science community, actually, um, and I am an utter novice compared to everyone here. But uh, within the sciences, I have been working hard on this because I think it's incredibly important to have all voices represented in, in uh, science and in this broad scientific enterprise. So with that, thank you so much, Mary, for inviting me. Um, and uh, I really encourage as many faculty as possible to talk to their other fellow faculty um, to keep the conversation going. Thank you so much, David. And I didn't pay him for that plug. <laughs> but yes, and if you're interested in the diversity seminar, please reach out to me. We're putting together our spring cohort. And um, so last but certainly not least, we always have to say that, right, is uh, Gail Vignola, uh, one of my a colleague of mine in the English department as well as in the EI effort. So hello, Gail. Oh, okay, so you're muted. Hold on. Yes, I am yep, muted. There you yep. go. Sorry. Okay, so um, thank you, Dr. Pritchett, and thank you, Mary, for inviting me. It, it's um, a really big bill to finish this because, you know, uh, it's it's a hard act to follow. But I'm going to um, place my the quote that I'm going to base my very quick talk about from Dr. King today because my um, the focus of my presentation has more to do with um, how we can get our students to be less silent about issues of social justice and how to get them more involved. So I've been, I'm in the English department. I've been here for, this is my, the end of my eighth semester, I guess. Um, so I started in 2018. And um, th the opportunity to teach core English at the freshman level, I also teach international students. So that gives me a great, international perspective as well. Um, so I, I took the, the diversity seminar with David a couple of years ago, and I'm also marginally involved in the, the diversity film series. We had an event that was canceled in September because of bad weather, but that we hope to bring uh, again this spring, perhaps, or in the fall. And in addition to that, um, I've been involved for the past 10 years uh, as an advocate for awareness and justice through my organization called Scholars for Syria, which is now um, an SGA club here on campus. Um, and for whom this, this advocacy program supports a population for whom social justice is nothing but a dream. Um, and the awareness of what's going on in Syria is why this organization exists because this country looks to the U.S. as a beacon of justice and the rule of law. And so in my classes, we do we do work on Siri. We do readings because I teach literature and um, nonfiction analysis. We do a lot of readings on the othering. We read books on the displaced and we do a lot of social justice readings. 
so that the students can become aware of these issues, and many of them are not. This morning, I listened to an NYU professor on TV talk about why college campuses haven't erupted in protest over the kind of terrorism on January 6th that poses a direct threat to our election system. Her argument was that there's still children living with COVID, working jobs to go to school because they're feeling financial pressure more than ever before, and perhaps not able to create change as much as they would like. This is her argument. She says they don't listen to the news. And this is true because I do a, a bias in journalism project um, as a midterm for my 1201 class. But at the same time, students did protest when George Floyd was murdered. It was a 17 year old who filmed his murder. So I believe that our students will take the lead if we give them the tools to do so. Whether it's a required poli-sci class or a civics class during freshman year, or making it easy to create clubs like we have that encourage both organizational skills and a platform. And a, a, a quick anecdote, one of my 1202 students who took my class remotely from California during COVID last spring, she came to campus in the fall and was so excited to be here in person, she immediately started her own social justice club with the support of Dr. Mott. She's a poli-sci major. And we, when we met for coffee for the first time in person, she was so excited about the ability to do this to, you know, she's very interested and she's Filipina and wants to sort of lift up her population. So the opportunity to do this on her campus um, was a big deal for her. I think it excited her more than her classes. So by creating coursework, including literature and music of the displaced and the othered and those who are marginalized, um, can, can help us encourage these young students and show them how solidarity can push beyond empathy, because I, I truly believe that every young college student has empathy but we can push them beyond that into shared action for change by setting good examples to instill that world perspective that Dr. Nair wrote about this morning in his email. So my quote um, has to do with, um, we have to repent not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. The word appalling, it, can be a little bit offensive, I think, because I see it less as appalling, but more as not being aware of what can be done. So, so many of my students have no idea what's going on in Syria. They don't even know where it is on a map or how many people have died or what the root causes are. So I think it's part of our job as um, social activists to create coursework that helps them just become more aware of what's happening in the world. And um, that's it. Thank you for listening and thank you for the platform. Thank you so much, Gail. I appreciate it. And thank you also, David and Mark and Natalie um, for agreeing to, to, to do this. And um, it's just such a privilege to work with, with people like that. There's an all, you know, all, all the people across campus who are really doing all this great work um, and they find them so inspiring. So Forrest, thank you again for inviting thank us. Thank you, Larry. Um, thank you all so very much for um, everything you brought to bear um, in your uh, presentations. We, many people need to hear that to know that there is work taking place on both at the university, say the macro level and, and the micro level and that local level. so important. I would close out uh, not just this one presentation with another quote from Dr. King. And I say this because we have many students who have signed up for this as a course. And the last quote would be, and I'm saying this in light of uh, North Korea shooting missiles into the air every day. And we, what we're measuring is, do any of those missiles have the capacity to reach North America, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Dr. King said, um, you know, we have, we can produce guided missiles, but at the same time we're producing misguided men and women. Mm -hmm. We have to think about what are our navigation systems. Thank you all. 
As I begin to close out today, I like to remind everybody that our technical staff will be placing a recording of the entire day on YouTube. Um, and if anybody is interested in that, you may simply just go under the, um, the Seton Hall sites on YouTube and you'll be able to access that probably within a couple of days or so. Uh, we really want to thank everybody who participated today. And um, also uh, keep in mind Dr. Marabella's uh, presentation or reminder about the program we'll be doing tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Uh, on uh, we now have a one of these national centers for racial healing has been approved and certified by the American Association for Colleges and Universities. And if you just drop a line to Dr. Marabella, you can get that link for our one hour presentation uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock. There will be a number of us doing small presentations that will then support Dr. Stephanie Harris coming in from the Amistad uh, Commission. Uh, I also want to give a big shout out to all the members of our central planning team, from the team, from uh, continuing ed, Diane and uh, Karen, the dean and the assistant dean, respectively. We want to thank our host academic instit uh, school, uh, College of Arts and Sciences, under Dr. Georgetta Frierson, better known, as she said this morning, as Dr. G. And, um, and all of you who had lifted a, a finger to assist us today. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, mm -hmm. immediately after this program, if you are so inclined, to uh, one of our community partnerships with the town of South Orange and Maplewood, they will be starting their MLK program at four o'clock. It is all virtual for one hour. Uh, the program will be approximately 30 minutes long. And then they encourage folks to go to their homes or apartments and to place a bag with hopefully a lighted luminary battery driven and to write messages of peace, hope, brotherhood, sisterhood and place it outdoors. Uh, we've been uh, working with uh, our local neighbors for at least four years in this project. And as a matter of fact, uh, we made sure that bags were available uh, through the College of Arts and Sciences with the luminaries for anybody who works at Seton Hall or who studies there. And I know housing and residence life staff picked up at least 100 of those bags for the students who began to move on the campus yesterday. Um, we thank you all for supporting uh, the work that is done uh, to uphold Dr. King. And as I said in the very beginning, uh, Seton Hall has the unique distinction, according to the King family, when I met with them a couple of years ago, uh, they had launched a project to identify every project um, in America or program which is named after Dr. King. And then they had a, another project that they were doing in conjunction with Harvard University in their School of Engineering uh, to identify every physical place uh, in America, a street and boulevard named after Dr. King also. And to the best of their knowledge, the MLK program and scholarship at Seton Hall University is probably the oldest uh, and most significant program uh, established in their So I always bring you greetings from the King family. I think I've handled all of the items that I'd like to handle for right now. Um, so if all uh, is well with all of my tech team and support staff, we will bid you all a, a fair adieu until next year, God willing, but we're not going to wait to do the good work. As John Lewis would say, we are all about the good trouble. So we look forward to seeing you on the roadway and the crossroads of life. Thank you all and God bless.